Okay, we're ready to go. Alan, you may continue. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, so we're about to go through an example of how this could work. This is one of our uh, 5,000 or so stochastic examples. Um, we we start, used as a starting point a 12% investment volatility um, and assumed that we'd set the trigger at 18%. So this is the more conservative, the, the, you need a, a higher return in order for, for this uh, de-risking trigger to happen. Um, and we assumed that we would always do a 25 basis point uh, reduction in the discount rate um, getting us uh, something between um, 75 and basis points and 100 basis points between 0.75 percent and 1 percent reduction in the um, contribution volatility. Um, and this particular plan that we're looking at is the state miscellaneous plan. Each plan will be slightly different. Um, so this is the um, nice stable investment return uh, that this uh, particular scenario generated. Um, they're all like this. Uh, this is not particularly volatile. It's not particularly stable. This is this is what a 12% um, standard deviation on investment returns produces. Um, and so you'll see in this one, in the third year, we actually get above slightly above 20%. Um, and so that's when the first de-risking event will occur, uh, right there. So. The example that we've got here, this is the uh, projected employer contribution rate um, just, just prior to that first good investment year. Um, so this is what we would have been showing in the employer's um, valuation report, although it's, this does have the um, change in the normal cost due to more PEPRA members coming on, which uh, we wouldn't actually be showing in the valuation report. But this, this is the type of information the employer would have available prior to that first de-risking event. This is what they would be expecting in the way of their contribution requirements. So if we just have the good investment return, um, this is what we would be showing as the uh, employer required contribution. Um, so you can see that it's uh, considerably better than what they were expecting. Um, but with the, if we elected to do flex, flexible de-risking, then in fact, there, with the uh, reduction in the uh, discount rate um, and the reduction in uh, contribution volatility beyond that, this is what we would be expecting to see in, the, um, in their contribution rates going forward. So you can see that the flexible de-risking means that the employer contribution rate will be more than it would have been if we had not done it, so more than the red line, but less than the, uh, what they were expecting, which is the blue line. Um, and for anyone who's colorblind, I apologize. I had meant to have some uh, points along there, squares and circles, so that you could see it. But, uh, I think you can probably guess which line is which. The green one is in the, wo the one in the middle. Yes? How, how much of each of those is normal versus, normal cost versus, you know, the unfunded? So the blue line and the red line have exactly the same normal cost. Um, the green line, after the de-risking event, has a slightly higher normal cost. And I think that's one of the things that's causing that little kink in the green line. Um, so that is actually a, uh, that is causing a slight change in the normal cost. We do have um, somewhere, um, I think, what a one quarter percent drop in the discount rate does to the normal cost. Um, David, have you got that? Yes, yeah, the, the impact on the normal cost of lowering the discount rate by about 25 basis points was just a bit less than 1% of payroll, so about 0.8 in, in the case of this plan here. The answer will be different depending on which plan you're looking at, but for this one it was 0.8% of payroll. So. Also, when we do the de-risking, 
um, we actually are expecting a change in how the, the investment returns after the de-risking event. So here, the first de-risking event results in a slightly, very slightly different contribution, uh, investment returns after the de-risking event. Um, but you can see it doesn't, occur, doesn't impact the peak because, well, there was no change. The change occurred after the peak. Uh, you can also see that it's hitting um, another peak in about year seven or eight. Um, and so that's when the second de-risking event occurred. Um, a year later, we actually have slightly lower volatility. And you get, now, you're, now, now it's becoming a little bit more obvious that we are actually reducing investment return volatility. Um, you've got a third de-risking event um, and a fourth de-risking event occurring in just, uh, I think, year 22 it is. Uh, so you're seeing each of these de-risking events, but you still have, at, at this point, a fair amount of contribution volatility. It's less than it was before, but you've still got a fair amount of contribution volatility. So let's take a look at what this does to the employer contribution rate. Um, so this is what the employer contribution rate would have been um, over the period if we had not done any de-risking. Um, starting at in the 20% range, dropping in years 21 through about 30 to a quite low level, um, the normal cost presumably, and in increasing again um, as we got some relatively poor investment returns out beyond that. With the first de-risking event occurring, um, what we're seeing is an increase in the contribution rate or rather the contribution rate does not decrease as much as it would have if we had not de-risked. Um, but it's following pretty much the same pattern. And right near the end of this graph, you're actually getting to a point where the de-risking has resulted in a contribution rate that's the same as if we had not done de-risking. And that's because some of those losses in late years were avoided by having the lower investment volatility. After the second de-risking event, very similar pattern. Um, with this one, unfortunately, we had some uh, rather poor years just after the de-risking event, so that's why they, that contribution increases right there. Um, but it's not increasing much more than if we had uh, not done that second de-risking. And again, you can actually, on this one, see a crossover as some of the losses late in the, late in the simulation were avoided by having a lower investment volatility. And it keeps going and going. Um, so there's what we are seeing with this scenario. This is scenario is essentially a pretty good scenario in early years. So you are actually somewhat hurt by having these de-risking events because you de-risked before, de before some good periods. But you are saving a fair amount in the later portion of this uh, particular scenario because that's a period where you get some poor investment returns, and so having less risk is a good thing in that period. Again, um, the axis, the x-axis? The x-axis. Um, I'm sorry, the y. The, the right. left one, yeah. That is the employer contribution rate. Okay. So going from a minimum of about 5% up to 25% at the top of the graph. So let's see what happens to the funded ratio. Um, this is the basic scenario, uh, pretty good period of time in the first part of the chart, going from years one through about year 23 or so. Um, steadily improving funded status because we're getting some good investment returns. Uh, we are paying off the unfunded liability, but most of that increase in funded status is really due to uh, this scenario having a fairly good period of investment returns. And then a rather, rather, a very bad period from about year 27 or so to year 40. Um, this is purely random. Uh, we did pick this scenario because it had some interesting characteristics. But this is randomly generated, and there's many others like it in our, uh, in our simulation. 
Um, by de-risking, we lowered the discount rate, we increased the liabilities of the system using a lower discount rate. That actually reduced the funded status. But because of the additional contributions and lower, vol lower volatility, that actually, over the course of this scenario, results in um, a higher funded status late in the period. You'll note that in the good times, less risk costs you money. You get less investment returns because you've got less investment risk. And so in the early part of the graph, you're seeing the downside to de-risking. In the later part of the graph, you're seeing the upside to de-risking. That's one of the reasons why I kind of like this particular scenario is because it shows both sides. Um, second de-risking event occurred. It's a very similar pattern. Uh, you get hurt on the upside. You win on the downside. Third and fourth de-risking. So one of the things that I also looked at in this scenario is how low did your funded status go? Um, after, with all of the de-risking in place, funded status still fell to 55%. Not a good, this is not a good, this is not a rosy scenario. Um, but without the de-risking, your funded status would have fallen to about 40%. Um, so this, de in this scenario, de-risking certainly helped, and it helped at a point, maybe not enough, but it helped at a point where you really needed to, needed to have some help. So this is, to me, a very good demonstration, both of some of the limitations of de-risking, uh, because de-risking does, does hurt you in good investment periods. But it also shows you some of the real benefits of de-risking in that when you have a, an extended period of bad markets, um, you're going to be hurting a lot. And this means that the pain in those periods is less. Whoops. Um, yes. So I, this is really helpful to sort of conceptual to, to, to sort of more concretely see what, what this is going to what this could do. Although I recognize there's only one scenario out of thousand, but um, or however many you ran, um, it would be useful in future presentations when you bring this back, I'm sh as I'm sure it will come back, or I hope it does, um, if you would include a, sh a chart of what happens to the normal cost, and if you could also include an estimate of what percentage of the workforce is subject to the PEPRA rules, because I think th that will obviously change over time, and, and so that would be also just sort of a helpful piece of information. Thanks. Okay, we'll do that. So at this point, I would uh, like to engage the board in a bit of a discussion. Um, you know, I want to ask you a little bit about what's the, uh, I want us to be thinking about the appropriate level of volatility in our portfolio. I do not need a, an answer on this one right now. Um, uh, whether or not we should pursue de-risking, again, just a discussion. I don't want, I don't need guidance on this one at this point. Um, when should we start? What's the approach, uh, flexible, systematic, or combination, and how long until we reach the desired level of volatility? All of these things are things that we need to think about, talk about, if we are going to pursue de-risking. Um, so in terms of the appropriate level of volatility, one of the questions I always ask myself is, if we, are, if we were 100% funded today, which is our goal, um, are we going to be comfortable with the level of risk in the system? Because if the answer is no, at 100% funded, we're not comfortable with the level of risk, and we're targeting 100% funded, that means we're targeting a level of risk that we don't really want. And so that says that we need to do something different. Um, so we took a look at, well, if we were 100% funded today, and we are invested in a portfolio with about a 12.5% volatility. Um, what's the probability of falling below 80% funded at some point in the next 30 years? And the answer is, well, there's about a 50% chance of us falling below 80% funded. Well, I mean, that's where we are right now. 
Um, so that's, that means that we'll be facing something like what we are today at some, about a 50% chance. But there's also something like a 25% probability of falling below 60% funded. That's lower than we went even through this latest period. Even at the end of the uh, 08, 09 market crash, we were not that low. Um, so this says that there is about a 25% chance that if you start at 100% funded, you will at some point be less well funded than we were kind of at the, at the worst period that we experienced recently. But with a 10% volatility, that number falls to only a 15% chance. At an 8% volatility, and these are the volatilities of the investment mixes, that probability falls to about 10%. So I don't know that these are the right funded levels to be looking at. Um, I think this is the one that Henry likes, um, although I think that there's some debate as to which is the what, right one to look at. But this is the type of information that I think I will be continuing to bring back to you so that you can assess, the fa assess whether or not you like where we are in terms of funding risk. Yes, J yes, Mr. Yeah, Jelinczyk. There is, yeah, JJ works. Uh, <laughs> there is an upside to the volatility as well. Um, and I understand that we, you know, try to avoid the downside, but we ought to recognize that if we avoid the downside, we're giving up on some of the upside. Um, is one of the people pointed out lunch. In some ways, it's a guarantee that there won't be increased benefits. Um, but we really, if you're really going to make a informed decision, you need to look at both sides and that's right. you know, not And that's, uh, that's a valid, that's a good point. Um, that is also one of the reasons why I tend to focus not on the 80% funded level because the 80% funded level, I think, is a level that we may need to be willing to accept in order to get the upside. Um, the, the lower funded status um, I think is an area where you may be saying, well, we can't, we cannot go there even to get the upside. That, and, and so that is one of the reasons why I've tended to focus on that. Having said that, um, I will see what we can do to include the type of information you're looking for as well. Thank you. So, Sorry. So yes. you're, you're looking for some feedback. <laughs> I'm looking for some I feedback. Hear, I heard that ringing. And, and I apologize. The question really um, should be, you know, really I, what I'm getting, trying to get at is should we move forward with pursuing de-risking as a concept, not commit to implementing it? Um, that's not really what I'm asking for, although I, I do think that we need to address that question. Today is not really the time to do it, but your thoughts would be appreciated. Yes. So I feel very strongly that we should pursue uh, further analysis around de-risking. And, um, and I personally think that the, the fourth option that I threw out earlier of, of flexible w with some sort of targets and goals and sort of timeline for revisiting or, or milestones for revisiting um, would makes that makes sense to me, but I'm I'm interested in in so so I the systematic to me could, the timing could be so bad <laughs> that that it could just be excruciatingly painful, and I think we need to have some flexibility around around that. Not so much flexibility that we don't do anything. So I mean, I do want us to be checking in, right? But um, but I I just worry that with something systematic, it could just end up at the exact wrong time and then be disastrous. Um, so that's my two cents on that. I, in terms of the, the comfortable level of risk, I, I don't, I'm not sure that's the right question. Because in my view, and Ted and I were just talking about this earlier, is that once we've hit 100% funded on a plan, we should not in, reintroduce risk. I mean, we should, we, should, we, should ha we should just be in preservation mode, because that's all we need to do is deliver the, is deliver the benefits. And, and so um, Can't do it. So I guess that's, that's my personal feeling is that um, 
is, I'm, not, I'm not 100 percent sure about these different levels of volatility and what that means. I think we should de-risk until we get to 100 percent funding, and then, and then, or I don't know. That's okay. I appreciate the thought. Um, I th think I've got JJ and then Henry, Bill. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, the answer is yes, from my view, of, of continuing to pursue it. Uh, I, I think one of the challenges we have with uh, uh, flexible is these are very tough decisions to make. And that feeds into the other problem which I talked about earlier, which is the fact that employers are different and that right now we're not set up to accommodate those differences in terms of the impact of de-risking. And so I, I obviously still have a concern about the ability to, have, to be able to accommodate the differences, different status of employers. Uh, but I, I think we absolutely need to pursue it. I think one of the challenges, you reach, you reach 100 percent, you de-risk, and you immediately go to 80 or 90 or whatever the math, whatever the math takes you to. Uh, so you've got to actually get above 100 to get to, uh, back down to a risk-free uh, portfolio. Uh, you know, when we come back to the issue of our fiduciary responsibility, that drives all of these decisions. So while I like a systemic approach because it takes some of the uh, t very tough decision making out of it, the reality is we can't handle individual employers right now, especially those that are probably need the de-risking the most are the ones that where it's toughest to do. So, but we should still pursue it. I think I've got JJ, then Henry, then George. Yeah, I, I, I think we ought to continue to pursue it. There's clearly some interest on it, and, and I'm not sure how that we yet fully understand some of the implications. Um, you know, as we de-risk and reduce the volatility of the employer contribution, um, you know, it's really a benefit that flows to the employer. Um, and one of the benefits that flows to the employer is by reducing the normal costs, we get the employee to pick up more of the, the cost. Um, so they get both less volatility and are required to pick up less of the total cost. Um, so I, I think we really need to think about the Im impacts on the normal cost. Um, as I pointed out to you, at, lunch, although you did mention it, you know, it wasn't until slide 29 of 33 that we get around to looking at the impact on the, on the members. And, you know, our fiduciary obligation is to the members. We have a secondary obligation to try and reduce the cost and need to recognize that reducing the risk is increasing the cost. Um, now, it may be a trade we want to make, but I think we really do need to better understand the implications of all that. Henry? Yeah, uh, yeah, I definitely think uh, we should pursue it. And um, I'm not so sure which approach is the best, but I think uh, if you were to bring the uh, different approaches back with the pros and cons and what your judgment, what your thinking is on, around each of these, what help us kind of internalize it and, and reach uh, some kind of uh, decision. And I also would m m not want to stop at 100%. I think we should go above 100% <clears throat> to create kind of a, a cushion or a reserve, if you will. Uh, and I, my thoughts about uh, our fiduciary responsibility, the system is for the member. So our whole goal should be the sustainable system going forward and that is for the members, so that's why I think this is a, would be a good approach to, 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 to pursue. Thank you. Um, I think George and then Terry. Um, we, we, Priya suggested that, uh, as I understood, if we hit 100 percent, then we would just stop and freeze things, but that's not possible. <laughs> I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it too here. Never. And I don't know what the what the funded status would go to if you went from seven percent, let's say, down to a risk-free rate. Uh, today, that's I suppose on the order of half that—a 30-year 
treasuries or someplace in the 3.7, I think, range. Um, so, so that, that, that's just a comment on that. It's not, it's not as simple as we get to 100%. Uh, so now we can, now we can just freeze things and and uh, uh, take all risk out. Um, I, as I've talked to you, I'm also interested in. I, I am interested in the de-risking and, and alternatives because as I wondered, um, and it's I agree, it's up to, to you and the investment people to look at alternatives to what is the risk of a, uh, a higher rate of return, but that with either a lower a d a reduced discount factor or a higher a higher funded status where you shoot for a 110 or 115% funded status as a way of giving you a, a greater cushion um, if you're in a 12% risk situation um, than you would need if you were in an 8% risk situation. So i um, interested in seeing kind of how, how these how these trade off. As, as the overarching thing that I, when I read this and I noticed was that there's no, on the three alternatives you show here on slide 24, they clearly have much higher costs on average at the 8% volatility level than at the 12.5%, and, and uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're trading off, um, uh, the, higher, the higher cost um, versus um, uh, at, for, for greater security or less risk. Oh, and I also think, um, I think Henry said this, um, an increase in normal cost does increase cost to the employee, but that's not the only risk that the employee um, has in this in this in this system. So, the sustainability of the pension system itself, the staving off ballot box attempts, is very important, and uh, the employer the employer contributions uh, feed directly into that uh, equation. Thank you, um, Terry. Um, we think I think this is an important topic, but. Quite frankly, it's something that uh, doesn't have to be right on the burner. I mean, this is something that I'd love to be in a position of having near 100% funding, but that's going to take some incredible investment returns between now and some time period to uh, achieve that level. And, and I don't think we're, we are necessarily going to be in a position to execute on anything like that in the near term. We need to understand it, but I don't think it's something that you have to uh, you know, rush back to us uh, in the near term. Um, Michael and then JJ. Just real quickly, I think you've got consensus from the board that we're interested in moving forward. I glanced ahead and I'm really anxious to see on your next slides actually some of the information that comes forward that on this subject, so I'd like to move forward. Well, and if we do get to 100% funded at some point, and we're really to de-risk the portfolio and say go to all treasuries, you know, because people said we ought to use the risk-free rate. I'm sure that those people who are telling us we should be using the risk-free rate are the same people who would be then suing us for leaving so much money on the table. I think, yeah. I, I think a very interesting conversation is going to be a, a conversation about what, what is the objective? How far to go? How quickly? That, I think, is a very big, very uh, interesting discussion. Um, I, don't, I don't think that I'm not interpreting the board's direction today as saying that we should go to a risk-free, take all of the risk off the table. That is very much a discussion that has to happen well, in the future. It, it, but it would clearly be far down the line. Um, but I would point out that the people who are saying you're, t <coughs> you're assuming too high returns, you're taking too much risk, are not people who are particularly friends of public employee pension plans. Um, so another question is, if we are thinking about de-risking, when should we start? Um, so one idea would be uh, to table the uh, idea for a few years until employer rates have stabilized. Um, and the impact of recent changes has been fully reflected in their, in their contribution rates. Another option would be to wait until we get to 100% funded. Um, or we could de-risk the very first time we get um, an opportunity to de-risk. Um, certainly, I think my preference would be that we not put off de-risking 
indefinitely, which uh, really the this the second one is putting them off in putting it off indefinitely. Um, the first option is delaying it. Um, I don't know if that's that's a, a thought. Um, what are your thoughts? I got Henry up first. I, I don't think we should delay it. Uh, just as we have uh, embarked upon this whole um, factored uh, risk approach for asset management liability, we've been talking about this for two years now, and we're just about getting to a point where we now understand it and ready to take some action. So I think this kind of subject matter should begin as soon as maybe er at the earliest point at the July offsite to start talking about this and so that we could begin to internalize and understand it because I think if we uh, it's if you wait till something happen and then you start trying to rush to implement it I think you missed the mark and I think we should be prepared to take advantage of the situation when it occurs going forward and you can only do that after you've gone through a process of discussion and, de and deliberation so I would say sooner than later um, Priya, then JJ? I would Excellent. agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Jones' comments, um, although I do think we should wait. I, I, I would agree that July is a good time, because I do think we should wait till after we make a decision around that affect the discount rate this time around and see what the impacts are of that. Um, but I think we should start thinking about a policy and, and a program um, that then will be implemented whenever we have an event. Um, so we should put that in place sooner rather than later. JJ? And, and yeah, I think we need to continue to study it and look at it and try to understand <laughs> it. Um, I think we we have made some actuarial changes that are going to have an impact, and it may make some sense to let those work their way through before we consciously start de-risking. Um, one of the things that I, I'd like to point to is we decided to do um, risk adjustment on health benefits, which made a lot of sense until we actually saw the numbers and realized that the raw numbers didn't, we didn't really understand what was in there. Now we've made some adjustments. And I don't want to get us in a position where we make these assumptions without understanding what we're actually, or these changes without understanding what we're actually buying into. Um, it's and a good point. And it's also, um, struck me that um, we didn't haven't said it yet today, uh, but it is true that we have already taken some actions uh, to de-risk the system. Um, actions of the board earlier this year on the um, act, uh, smoothing methodology um, was an action to lower the overall funding risk. So um, I think that we need to sort of come back to with a more holistic view on on de-risking. Um, and some details um, as we've come up, uh, as has been suggested already today. Um, yes? So just so I understand the calendar and how this would work, if you started working on this now and the, we came back at the July offsite and we were somehow able to reach a decision by the end of 2014 on this issue, the earliest this could possibly have an impact would be the fiscal year that ends July of 15, if you had to return, which means it would affect budgets starting which budget year? It would be the 16-17 budget year for the state and 17-18 um, yeah. for so, public agencies. So even if we move promptly on this, this is not something that, I mean, that's only the possibility that could take effect if we had a as we hope, we would have a great return over the quickest schedule possible. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> we are talking about something that is long term. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the sooner we start, the sooner we, we get to a de-risking event. But this is not something that is immediately around the corner. It's a good point. Any other comments? Seeing none. Um, I think we've already had some discussion on this. Um, I'm quite willing to skip over this question in the interest of time. I don't see any objection to that. Um, you know what? 
skip that one, and that one, and that one. <laughs> um, what's your thoughts about how, how long? What's the time frame? I've, in, in this presentation, I kind of focused on 15 years. Um, not that I think that's the right number, but that is far enough out that de-risking events can have a significant impact. Um, and yet not so far out that it seems unrealistic. Um, ultimately, I guess I'm concerned that we, even over a period as long as 15 years, we may not be able to make as much progress as we might like. So we may need a, an even longer time frame than that. Um, if we do go there, we might think about sort of setting interim targets. Um, what's your thoughts on that? It's, 15 years too far out? Um, or do I need to show you how much of an impact that is before you can make that? Yeah. Looks but like. I, I um, do think interim targets make sense in any case. Yeah, I, I, ultimately, <laughs> this is a big challenge to make. To, de risking is, is something that's probably going to take a long time. It's a big, huge challenge. I think we're going to have to break that down into smaller chunks in order to make it work. Um, so next step forward, um, we were look, thinking that we might ask you s for some uh, formal approval of a de-risking concept sometime in the spring or summer of 2014. That would match with the uh, board offsite, although to get formal approval, we'd probably have to come back in August. Um, but we, beyond that, we would actually have to develop the formal policies. Uh, these would be policies that are neither truly investment policies nor truly actuarial policies, but rather um, high-level funding policies, um, which would be appropriate to come out of uh, an asset liability management process. So uh, we'd be looking at, assuming that we get approval of... Uh, a formal, a formal approval of a specific concept in uh, summer of 2014. We'd be looking at coming back in the fall or winter of 2014-15 uh, with a formal set of board policies, um, which would kind of match the timeline that uh, Mr. Slayton was talking about. Yes. But Alan, it, at the July offsite 2014, would be the first time we would have a detailed discussion. And you're saying that we're going to approve it then? I mean, that, to me, that's too soon. That is a concern. Um, for, the, for the approval, not to get for, started. For the approval. Yeah. I, I think that I would still look at um, maybe having a workshop in July, um, really fleshing out the, the concept. Um, Probably coming out of that, I may, may well come out of that with directions for further refinements, which I would try to turn around and get back to you as soon as I could. Um, I don't know that that may, in fact, mean that we have to come back not just with the further refinements, but a second time to get final approval. Um, so that's, we're going to have to, I, I suspect the timeline will be a little bit flexible for a while still. And... I think I, I think I got all the questions I, <laughs> I need. If there are any other questions before we move on, um, I'd be happy to take them at this time. Okay, our next section that we're going to uh, go through, and we'll try to speed it up a little bit so we don't, uh, I think we're probably about 40 minutes or so behind schedule at the moment. We're going to do a, a review of sort of the roles, the capital market assumptions, and some of the constraints that have been applied in the construction of the various uh, candidate potential portfolios uh, that really illustrate kind of risk and return patterns. The other thing we're going to try to achieve with this section in the uh, material is to give you a, a bit of a sort of economic view, if you will, and we have John Rothfield who is really the sort of CalPERS economist who John works within the fixed income team uh, within the investment office. And 
really what we wanted to understand from John's perspective is whether or not we think that the market environment is either conducive or not conducive to the sort of risk-seeking portfolio that CalPERS um, is, you know, still maintains, up, at least up until this point in time. So I think without further ado, we would just turn it over to John, and maybe we could pass the uh, clicker down to, to John. That's a good start. I got the clicker to work. Uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to be able to talk to you today. Uh, what we decided to do was to uh, look at some fundamental economic assumptions that were reasonable to think about for the U.S. economy over the next three and ten years. So, um, the slide you're seeing up there is it goes to the issue of the three-year economic outlook. And just to very quickly uh, go backward for a second, uh, the U.S. economic recovery is about four years old, according to the uh, Business Cycle Dating Committee. Uh, we came out of recession in the middle of 2009, so we're roughly four years into a recovery. Uh, the growth over that time in real terms has been about two and a quarter percent. In a typical, uh, the last two recoveries, growth has been three and a quarter to three and a half percent. So it's been a relatively low growth recovery in the economy. Um, and the growth has been relatively stable. We haven't had any uh, volatility in the, in the rate of growth of the economy. So in a way, that's actually been favorable for uh, the market environment because we haven't had any major surprises other way in, in growth. So growth has been slow and stable. Uh, what is the outlook for the next few years? Probably a, a continuation of relatively slow growth. Uh, we've deleveraged a lot in both the household and the corporate sector in the U.S., uh, but the international environment is not particularly conducive for a major acceleration of growth. Um, and um, so we, we think that probably growth will remain uh, slow and stable. However, uh, there are some reasons perhaps to think that uh, a number of uh, factors will be working inside of slightly higher growth over the next few years. So. My view is we probably won't be seeing growth in the two and a quarter percent range, but growth a bit higher than that, but still uh, fairly stable growth. Uh, we think inflation is going to remain low. Uh, when the Fed uh, started to expand its balance sheet aggressively uh, with, the rel uh, with the various rounds of quantitative easing that it did, there was some concern that that would ultimately create inflation in the U.S. economy. However, most inflation measures in the U.S. are now well below the midpoint of the Fed's target. Uh, which is two to two and a quarter percent, depending on how you measure it. Most measures of core inflation in the U.S. are in the low ones. And so um, uh, we think that uh, over time that is probably going to continue. Part of the reason that that's probably going to continue is when you think of upside potential for the growth of the economy, uh, a lot of that would be supply side improvements in the economy. So in other words, uh, you're increasing supply of houses, you're inc increasing supply of gas, uh, through oil and gas extraction in the economy. Uh, you're increasing manufacturing supply because of the improved competitiveness of, of U.S. corporations. And in a way, supply and demand are both moving up at the same time. Now, that is opposed to, say, a demand shock to the economy. So let's say, um, you know, the, the government increases spending or uh, uh, asset price bubbles occur and uh, household spending increases, but you're not getting a commensurate increase in supply, that would tend to be inflationary. But if you're looking for upside in growth that's based on supply, which drives an, a, a commensurate increase in demand, that tends to be less inflationary uh, than, than a demand side uh, gain in the economy. Uh, the downside risk to the, to the economy are mostly evident around policy. Uh, if the uh, federal government does nothing about um, some of the long-term budgetary issues in the U.S., over the next few years, uh, the level of uh, government debt or federal government debt could reach the highs of the Second World War uh, around the middle of the 2030s. So over the next couple of years, uh, the, go the federal government has to agree uh, to various long-term changes to the budget. Otherwise, uh, investors start to project uh, a fast rate of growth of U.S. debt over the next few years. Uh, the other one, of course, is the Fed has built up its balance sheet to about $4 trillion. Uh, how do investors react when we get to a point where uh, 
the Fed has to stop doing that uh, or decides to stop doing that and what's <coughs> going to happen to the economy. So the downside risks of the economy are mostly evident around policy. Uh, another a key assumption, I think, over the next three years is that international economic conditions are going to depend on difficult growth transitions in Japan, China, and the commodity exporting emerging countries. So we all know that uh, Japan has an aging economy, and they're trying a new form of uh, uh, policy change in, in Japan to try and boost uh, investment and productivity in, in that economy. Uh, we're six months into, uh, in, into this change in, in uh, policy in Japan. We haven't particularly uh, got runs on the board yet in terms of change in behavior and higher investment, higher labor force participation in Japan. Uh, but the jury is still out on whether that's going to work over the next three years. Uh, Japan is still the third largest economy in the world, so the success of Japan in, in affecting this change in uh, their policy has an important read-through for the rest of the world. We all know that Chinese growth has uh, downsized from about 12 percent a year to about 8 percent a year, and uh, the question is, I think, over the next few years, Will, uh, will that Chinese growth rate continue to step down uh, and or will that growth become less uh, commodity intensive as they move away from investing in infrastructure to, to investment in consumer goods and can they pull that off without major uh, short-term impacts on the economy. And related to that, uh, countries such as Brazil, uh, Russia and uh, Mexico uh, even countries like Canada that export commodities to places like uh, China. If Chinese demand for commodities slows down, can these very important economies, I think Brazil is about the eighth largest economy in the world and Russia is right, right up there as well, can they make the transition away from uh, being an exporter of commodities toward more balanced growth in their economy? So we have started to see uh, somewhat of an improvement in the global economy, but there are these crucial issues over the next few years. Um, and then, of course, <coughs> Europe. Uh, Europe uh, is still in the middle of a transition away from um, uh, an era of very low interest rates once they joined the single currency, which caused an over-leveraging in a number of countries. We're moving away from that model now. Finally, after th uh, two years, the European economy has started to grow again, uh, but it's very unconvincing growth. And if you look at the le rate of leverage in Europe, Europe is probably going to remain a low growth region over that three-year period of time. So the international environment that's so important for the U.S. Uh, remains uncertain. You've laid out what the issues are in Japan, China, the commodity exporting. <coughs> uh, do you feel that they're going to succeed, or do you doubt that they will succeed? And what's your confidence level? Well, uh, in, in terms of Japan, uh, Jap and, and we've just come back from a trip to Japan and, and spoken to a lot of investors and, and, and economists and uh, heard about the, the corporate, how, the, how the corporate sector is developing in, in Japan. I must say I think that um, you know, the, the Japanese economics is based on a third level of change, which is the so-called structural reforms or the third arrow of reforms. And that involves things like trying to improve the labor force participation rate, getting more women to work, uh, getting aged people to work uh, for longer in the economy. And, uh, you know, the question is whether just a change in the policy level at government can, can change behavior at the corporate and the household level. And uh, what we saw there in speaking to investors was a uni fairly unanimity, unanimity of opinion uh, that that's going to happen but very little on the X's and O's of how you're going to get there. And we've already seen a bit of a backtrack by the Japanese government in terms of some of the reforms on the labor market where they were going to make it more easy for her firms to both hire and uh, more, more flexible labor market. The government has had to back up on that. So I would say that despite the strong opinion within Japan that they're going to succeed at this last chance of boosting the growth of the economy, uh, I'm, I'm fairly sceptical about, uh, you know, personally fairly sceptical about whether they're going to succeed uh, yet uh, until we see some evidence that they're actually changing structural policy and that the corporate and household sector is changing their behaviour. In terms of China, you know, I personally think that if you look at uh, 
the, the urbanisation rates that are happening there, uh, the, the still low level of investment, uh, the very high savings rate of 50 per cent, um, I think that they can effectively transition. They're moving toward a more market orientated economy by setting up free trade zones in Shanghai, uh, what's happening in, in Hong Kong uh, with, the, uh, with the offshore market for the, for the Chinese renminbi. Um, I, I personally feel fairly comfortable that, uh, uh, given all these factors, the Chinese can probably succeed. They have a lot of levers to pull. So I'm more of the view that China is going to continue to grow fairly strongly, even if the commodity or energy intensity of their growth is going to come down what some watch. So probably a little bit more skeptical on Japan, uh, more positive on China. Uh, and, and I think probably China is more important, the Chinese story, the transitioning to, toward consumption, uh, continuation of growth in, in China is probably more important for the U.S. story. Thank you. Sure. Yes. What impact do you think the sort of broad and broadening divide between, you know, the wealthy and the and and regular workers is going to have on the growth opportunity for the U.S.? Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, the um, uh, what, one of the things that's happened in the last few years is uh, very low rates of household formation. Uh, we were used to every year about one and a half million new households being formed. What's tended to happen over the last few, basically since the late 1990s, but even more so since the last recession, uh, we've had household formation happening at, at 500 to 750,000 per year. And that goes to the issue about, um, you know, um, uh, whether there are uh, two groups of economic agents in the economy, some of them doing better than others. If you break down the improvement in household worth that's happened since the turnaround and improvement in the economy since 2009, uh, there's one group that's doing particularly well, there's another group that's, that's been held back. So I, I think that that bifurcation of the, uh, of the US economy and, and you know, that has probably widened a little bit further since the recession began. Uh, does impact the rate of growth that we're able to achieve going forward. So I want to ask a question because I think Priya sure. raises a, a great question there. So when you do your three-year assumption based on growth, I mean, we use that term very broadly. I mean, whether it's in the equity market or in companies, but it's exactly sort of the, the point Priya makes is if you look at growth strictly from an unemployment number or employment number, uh, household savings, accumulation of debt, um, household formation. I mean, I remember back in 2000, we needed 225,000 new housing units in California. We've never seen to achieve that. Uh, I guess, in back to JJ's point is, you look at w your fundamental assumptions, but it, it's hard, as I'm sitting here reading Bloomberg, even looking at how you can even project three years out. I mean, we're at 7.3 percent unemployment, although we added 220,000 jobs last month. They weren't high-wage jobs. They mm -hmm. were, they were, they were part-time, low-wage jobs. Whether you support federal health care or not, an argument is being made that we're going to have growth, there's going to be a stifling in growth and people are going to peel back full-time jobs to get underneath the numbers for, for, for part-time positions. How, do you, how did you factor that into the growth? I mean, I know, you just look at the numbers, but there seems to be much more down or upside risk, particularly what's going to go on Congress in the next year, uh, and, and just how... Exactly as Priya said, you're, you're getting, particularly, I used this term last week in a speech, the gentrification of San Francisco. And the Twitter IPO is a prime example of that. You newly minted 1,600 millionaires last week. Average rent in San Francisco has gone up to $3,200. Six months when that when those stocks become unrestricted, you'll drive it up again. And, and so you're, you're starting to see the stratification, particularly here in California. How do we assume that risk going three years out? Okay. Well, let, let me uh, look at look at some of the um, look at some of the assumptions and and remember the, the both the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget who do numbers for the uh, projections for the for the budget balance over the next few years have a baseline that uh, over uh, 14, 15, and 16 will get a bit of above trend growth, uh, which is kind of a baseline forecast. Now you can argue around that on issues such as stratification. Uh, the rebound that we've seen in housing markets so far, the rebound in, you know, in in in, in financial asset prices and what that may mean. But uh, on on the chart on the left there, you can see that compared to the last two uh, economic cycles, uh, 
Uh, right now, we're uh, you know, nine to ten points below where we were in terms of growth that last time. Uh, so the economy is about nine points behind uh, a typical GDP path in a recovery, if you just look at the last two recoveries, 1991 and 2001. That's the level of, of, of gross product. Now, part of the reason for that is that if you look at the middle chart there, uh, real government spending is actually below where it was um, at the end of the last boom. Compare that to the, 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 the recession and recovery after the, uh, after, uh, in 2000, and you can see that at that point, government spending was about 13% higher than when, this, when, when the whole cycle started. Uh, in 1991, it was about 4% higher. Right now, we're actually about 1% down. So you can, you can make a case for uh, improved U.S. growth, even if you believe that government spending in the economy is about to start leveling out and, and improving uh, modestly over the next couple of years, because essentially you've had uh, the private sector growing um, growing uh, uh, stronger than, than the overall economy. Um, let me go on to the next page, which is, you know, which, which areas of the supply side of the economy can start to do better? We know that uh, if, if you just look at the monthly numbers on the, this energy boom that's occurring in the U.S. with oil and gas extraction, uh, back in the late 80s, uh, oil and gas extraction itself uh, it was about 4% of the value of the economy. It got down to about 1% during the, uh, the 2000s. If you start to project that rising, then you can get, a, again, a positive supply side shock to the economy, where this activity in the oil and gas sector uh, is starting to grow. Uh, economic, you know, economic growth will start to perform uh, stronger just simply based on this portion of the economy doing better. Uh, this, this sector also has uh, so-called multiplier effects onto the rest of the economy. So you need to build uh, roads, uh, other <coughs> infrastructure like rail, etc., to go along with this, uh, with this oil and gas story in the U.S. So uh, this is saying that um, uh, this is one part of the economy that could get back, not necessarily to the growth rates of the late 80s, but you're going to start to get it growing faster than overall GDP. Uh, the, the middle chart goes to the issue of the improvement in the, in the uh, competitiveness of the manufacturing sector that we've seen. Uh, because, partly because of a cheap dollar, uh, a weakening dollar, but also partly because of the productivity performance of U.S. manufacturing, um, <clears throat> even, in, e even uh, without worrying about the cheapening up of the U.S. dollar, uh, we have now a more competitive U.S. labor force than at any time since the 1990s. At some point, uh, the expectation is that that's going to generate an improvement in manufacturing activity in the U.S., um, when, particularly when you throw in things like cheap sources of energy for the U.S. manufacturing sector. I wouldn't want to uh, overblow the importance of that factor, but um, you can certainly make a case that certain industries like the chemical sector could do well as a result of cheap labor, a cheap dollar, and um, just generally the productivity improvements that have occurred in the manufacturing sector. There has already been a slight tendency for manufacturing to grow faster than the overall economy. Uh, again, you know, I, we, we're not going to see the reversal of the movement of manufacturing to emerging market economies that's occurred over the last decade or so, uh, but we probably will see a stabilization and slight improvement in the performance of U.S. manufacturing. Uh, a third factor, which is the chart on the right-hand side, which I wanted to emphasize, is that the business sector in the U.S. hasn't done that much investment. If you look at the 1960s to right through to 2000, real uh, business capital spending in the U.S. was growing at about 6% per annum. Since 2000, we've, that, that's only grown by about 2%. Now, admittedly, we've had two recessions over that time, but one of the, uh, one of the implications of this is that the capital stock in the U.S. is aging. Uh, that's clearly evident in the government sector where we haven't done much investment in new infrastructure. So the average age of the uh, U.S. capital stock has gone up to about 23 years. Uh, you know, at the start of the 1990s, that was closer to 20 years. So the, 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 the 
the government's infrastructure stock is, is, is getting older. Uh, also in the private sector, we've had um, an increased aging of the capital stock, um, which, which is the blue line in that chart on the right-hand side. So the thesis <coughs> is at some point with r relatively low cost of capital, uh, the U.S. corporate sector having a lot of cash reserves and the, and the average age of the capital stock rising, that at some point that's going to generate an above average rate of growth of investment. And it's important to note that in, in, although the average rate of growth of investment since 2000 has been only 2 percent, when we do get on an investment uh, uh, cycle, it has tended to grow at about 7 percent a year uh, before inflation. So one could make the case that uh, over the next few years, potentially we're going to get higher rates of investment by the U.S. corporate sector once some of the uncertainty around policy uh, goes away. Yeah. Yeah, John. Uh, and when you <clears throat> made reference to the middle chart, the U.S. manufacturing, you made reference to the weakening of the dollar. Yes. <clears throat> China is uh, attempting to become a re reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And so, number one, do you think that's going to happen? And number two, if it does, what will be the implications on the, the U.S. dollar uh, going forward? I, I think there has been a tendency recently for, you know, this development of an offshore market in Chinese renminbi uh, occurring in Hong Kong. Also, uh, China has made side agreements with a number of countries to uh, uh, denominate trade in those currencies, so the Australian dollar and the, and the Chinese dollar uh, and the Chinese renminbi, etc. So I think there's, there's definitely a tendency in, in China to uh, to um, start denominating in, in those currencies. Uh, but in terms of being a reserve currency, I think that's probably further down the track. I think that China in the near term probably has other things on the agenda. One of the things that will prevent the development is that China has so many reserves uh, of its own in foreign currency, right? So, and they're going to continue to run these large surpluses. To, you know, the, the U.S. dollar is partly a reserve currency just because simply we've been running trade deficits, etc. So um, I tend to think that as China moves toward a more consumer-based society, they will tend to want to keep the value of their currency relatively high and relatively stable, and that probably in the short term that doesn't have much implication for the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, th there is a case to be made that perhaps uh, uh, the U.S. dollar could rise over the next few years a little bit as, as the Fed stops its uh, major asset purchases, but I think more likely the U.S. dollar is, is likely to stay cheap and low uh, for an extended period of time, which will tend to help the manufacturing sector. And of course, we, you know, as China moves toward a more consumer-based society, and we can start exporting some of our energy, it's possible that our trade deficit gets uh, significantly smaller. Okay. Thank you. Another question is, you, you mentioned the quantitative easing, and the Fed, I think, lowered their target for unemployment rate down. Did they not from, what was it, before they stopped the quantitative easing? Yes, the, 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 there's a possibility that the Fed, uh, as, you know, in, in its next few decisions as we transition toward Janet Yellen uh, running the Fed, may reduce the unemployment rate at which time it starts to consider uh, uh, less uh, accommodative monetary policy, moving that down from 65 to 6%. It's possible that they'll do that. The Fed's also looking at um, uh, a number of much broader measures of the labour market as well, which are which are still only partly improved. So, I, you know, I would say that uh, there's still a lot of improvement to go in the labour market before the Fed is willing to consider, uh, you know, moving away from its aggressive stance on, on monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And last question, uh, we have, what do you think the inflation rate's going to be three years, ten years from now? Well, right now we've got a very low number. Yeah. Uh, if you look at all the core measures that the Cleveland Fed or the Dallas Fed or the Atlanta Fed puts out, and if you just look at the straight core numbers that come out of the government, uh, they're in the low ones. I'm personally of the view that we'll have a relatively low inflation rate, perhaps 2 percent. I don't think we're going to overshoot on the inflation side. Um, Firstly, I think the Fed's going to be able to manage its exit from unusually accommodative monetary policy by looking at bank reserves. Uh, 
So as, as credit channels relatively clear up, they can do things with policy uh, to, to impact the rate at which the banks offload those excess reserves. Uh, if you look at the ageing of the population, uh, we're getting toward a more ageing population and I think generally older people are more sensitive to price increases. You're seeing that in countries like uh, Japan. Uh, Japan has had very low inflation for a long period of time, uh, partly because they have an older population. Uh, and then if you look at some things that, you know, shelter is about a third of the consumer price index. We've had an increase in shelter prices, but over the next few years we're likely to have an increase in supply of housing, which will tend to take down that shelter inflation. So again, the supply side shocks the economy. More houses, uh, more energy production, potentially more manufacturing supply, uh, tends to mean that the supply side of the economy is going to keep up with the demand side, which everything else being equal should mean that we keep in a low inflation environment, particularly with what the Fed can do on policy. So I would say I'm more of the view that maybe two or slightly higher is what we're going to see on inflation, probably closer to two. Thank you. Sure. Uh, one other factor that I haven't mentioned in here is that, um, uh, which I didn't have in here, is the labour market itself. We still have a lot of unemployed resources in the labour market. We still have uh, three million or so workers uh, from the last recession who would like uh, to work more hours. So the, uh, we have an elevated uh, cohort of part-time workers and an elevated cohort of temporary workers in the economy. If the economy ultimately does improve or uh, businesses start to invest and employ more aggressively, uh, we have more workers moving from temporary to permanent work and more workers moving from part-time to full-time work. So you don't even need as much of a growth in the labour force as the population ages, but you start getting an improvement in the work that the existing uh, labour force is getting. So that is also relatively positive. Um, I just wanted to go to this important issue on, on the next page, which is the impact of uh, uh, housing. <clears throat> at, at the height of the, uh, uh, the housing boom, residential construction was between 5 and 6 percent of the, uh, the growth of the economy. Uh, during the downturn in housing, we got down to only about 2.5 percent. Currently, we're only at 3 percent. Now, if you look at builder sentiment, which has improved a lot, uh, you can project significantly higher rates of uh, growth in residential construction as a proportion of GDP, which will tend to drive overall growth higher over the next few years. Now, I tend to think that in this cycle, higher building sentiment doesn't mean that they're going to go out and build the same houses at the same rate as they did before. They realise that the kind of the supply demand situation has improved in their favour, but they realise also that the number of uh, households being formed each year because of this stratification of the labour market is going to be lower than it was before. So I do think the improvement in sentiment is going to be more aggressive than the improvement in residential construction that we see. And you can see that in the middle of the chart there too, uh, which goes to this issue again about the quality of the, uh, of, of, of the improvement in the economy that the number of uh, persons aged 16 and older per household is almost back to where we were in the, uh, basically back to where we were in the 1970s. So um, a lot of that has actually happened since the last recession. One can make the case that over the next few years that number will come back down again. Uh, as the quality of the economic recovery improves, you're going to start to get some of those folks who are living in their parents' house, etc., or forming larger households coming out and buying their own houses. So there'll be ele an element of that. Now, a lot of, uh, you know, number of private sector analysts have numbers in, the, in, in, in household formation improving, uh, doubling or tripling from where we are now. So from, you know, moving from a 500 <coughs> to 750,000 rate to a million five over the next few years. I tend to think it's been a, going to be a slower, more gradual improvement in household formation. Again, because of the, you know, the, the, the quality of, uh, of income improvement and, and the net asset position of these householders that are, that are forming larger households right now. So I, te I tend to think it's going to be a slower, longer recovery in the supply of housing. But it is an upside for uh, the US economy.
One final thing working for the U.S. housing sector is the chart on the right-hand side, which shows that uh, uh, you know price-to-rent and price-to-income ratios in the U.S. relative to their long-term averages are relatively low in the U.S. And it's the countries that didn't really have a boom uh, which are experiencing those low numbers. Japan, Germany, Korea, Ireland actually had a boom and bust. And the U.S. is right with them. So although we've had a recovery in U.S. house prices, they're not particularly extreme. Uh, they're certainly not extreme right now relative to rents and income that would say that we're about to suffer uh, a setback in the, in the improvement in the U.S. housing market. So I think the overall um, thing that I, you know, I think we should take away from that is that, you know, the first element of the improvement in the housing market has been on the on the price side because the supply of houses, has, except in the multi-dwelling sector, has been slow to respond. Um, I think the next thing that happens is we get more of a leveling out of price improvement, uh, but an increase in uh, supply of houses uh, becoming uh, a, a, a larger part of the housing story and that this cycle will go on for a more extended period of time uh, rather than the, than the uh, very quick uh, supply response that we saw in housing during the, the years of the so-called uh, you know, bubble in, in, in the late uh, 2000s. Uh, and then finally, on, on, you know, on the next page, the point I'd, I'd made before is that, uh, yes, the US economy's been growing at a rate of about uh, two and a quarter percent, uh, the private sector economy uh, has been growing at about three and a quarter percent. The government sector has been declining at about a two percent rate. Uh, when you take the latest numbers that came out since we put these charts together, the government sector is contracting right now at a rate of about three percent. So the question is, over the next few years, uh, will the government sector become more neutral for the economy, which allows the private sector rate of growth to become more prevalent to the overall rate of growth? And it's, it's likely to be the case. The middle chart there shows <coughs> what the International Monetary Fund says is so-called fiscal drag in the economy. So this year we had three hits to the economy from the government. The first was on January 1 when all of our taxes went up. Uh, on March 1 we had the, the so-called sequester hit the economy. And then on October 1 we had the second round of the sequester hit uh, the economy uh, in terms of cutting back spending. If we go into next year, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund has measured that fiscal drag in the economy will be one and a half points less next year than it was this year. So if you take away that drag from growth, you can come up with a much higher rate of US economic growth next year, something more akin to 3% versus the one and a half to one and three quarter percent that we have right now. And then a key other final element to that is what happens with uh, the state and local government sector. In terms of its impact on the economy, state and local governments have much more impact on economic growth than, than the federal sector. Um, what we've had in this cycle is an improvement in revenue from the state and local government sector that's about almost two years old. Uh, we, the, the, the revenue went very negative and now it started to print positive numbers, revenue growth versus a year early. State and local spending has actually remained quite low, and this goes to the issue about whether state and local authorities are rebuilding their reserves, dealing with unfunded uh, liabilities that they have and not increasing their spending. The good news is that if you looked at the uh, National Accounts Report that came out a couple of days ago, for the second quarter in a row, we actually, in GDP, in, in economic growth, we had a second successive quarter of state and local government spending actually increasing. That was after 13 of 14 quarters where it was actually declining. So there's actually some evidence now that the state and local government sector is taking some of this increased revenue and adding back some services, which adds to growth rather than subtracting from it. So the, in, in terms of, uh, I'll wrap up here in terms of the three-year uh, economic environment. Uh, the economy has grown unusually slow in, in this phase of the economic recovery. Uh, two and a quarter percent real growth over the last uh, few years and less than two percent inflation gives you a so-called inflation inclusive economic growth rate of only about four percent which is belong the long-term average below the long-term average um, in terms of uh, what we could expect over the next few years if you look at uh, we've reached the maximum point of takeaway from the government to the economy uh, if we 
create more uh, full-time and less temporary jobs. Uh, that's debatable given perhaps things like the, uh, you know, the, the, the health, what's, what's happening in healthcare and other things. But I think overall one could expect those, the quality of jobs in the economy to improve. Uh, if you look at household formation likely to increase as, uh, as the labour market uh, also improves. And if you look at uh, the prospects for improved business investment because businesses are getting behind in terms of the age of their, their investments and, and, and therefore having to do more to start creating um, <coughs> capacity to uh, meet rising demand in the future. One can make a case for that over the next three years economic growth to be a bit higher than it has over the last four years of recovery, uh, but still with low inflation. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what are some of the negatives on the economy uh, or potential negatives, we mentioned uh, policy surprises. Uh, you can see there that the, the Federal, <laughs> Federal Reserve's balance sheet uh, prior to the, uh, to the crisis was only a trillion dollars. It's now up to, to almost four trillion dollars. Uh, so the question is, uh, at some point, the Fed's going to begin tapering their purchases of uh, assets out of the market. Uh, and, you know, under some scenarios may even consider uh, selling some of those assets. I guess my view and the view of, of, of some members of our team is that probably the Fed is, going, is, is not going to need to offload these assets unless we get to a point where the economy is doing so well that they can sell some of their uh, treasuries and, and, and actually influence the long end of the, of the treasury market. So, if anything, this increased size of the balance sheet increases the flexibility of the Fed to be able to, re to respond to changing economic, stances, uh, economic circumstances even more aggressively than they had been before. Um, again, the, the second point there is if you look at the chart on the right, if the government does nothing about uh, entitlements and other things over the next few years, federal debt, and this doesn't include state debt, federal debt could get to about 100% of gross product, which is the highest we've seen uh, since World War II. So the big question is whether, uh, you know, both, both sides in Congress can get together and make some changes to um, long-term government programs to try and prevent that uh, blowout in, in, in debt. And then finally, the fundamental economic assumptions that may take us through the next 10 years. So I, I personally think the story over the next three years is fairly constructive. Positive supply side shocks the economy, causing somewhat of an increase in growth without much inflation. Uh, economic assumptions over the next 10 years. Well, uh, in, in uh, oh, sorry, so the next slide. Um, the, back in the day, the, the so-called potential rate of growth of the US economy had been considered to be 4%, then 3%. So you had, uh, increased participation in the labour force by uh, women. Uh, you had a relatively young uh, cohort of population that was coming through. So growth of the labour force in the US uh, was very strong. You're at a point now where uh, the population is ageing. Um, the participation in the labour force by women has actually started to come down a little bit in, in the last five years or so. And so the baseline rate of growth in the economy has started to come down again. Um, one baseline for what kind of so-called real growth we can expect in the economy over the next few years is that labour force will grow at about three quarters of a percent per annum. So that's growth of working age population, including birth and, and, and migration. However, the ageing of the population will tend to take out some 55 and olders. And, and the 55 and older are going to become a, continue to become an increasing proportion of the, labor, of, of the population over the next few years. So probably the labor force in the U.S. will grow at a rate of about a half a percent a year. That's way down below where it was in the 60s, 70s and 80s and, and, and even 90s. If you include typical productivity growth on top of that, let's say we get back to more normal productivity from the very low productivity we have now, which is actually close to zero, you could say maybe 1.5% growth of, uh, beyond the growth of the labour force. So you're probably looking over the next 10 years at a real growth of the economy at only about 
Now, there are going to be some years that grows faster than that, which I think the next three years will be. But I think the average over the next 10 years will probably be closer to 2% uh, real growth of the economy. That's a relatively low number. Yep. Uh, so just to for clarification, when you're talking about the labor force, are you talking about the actual working population or those who are available to work? Because clearly we've seen a lot of people drop out of the workforce just yes. because they haven't been able to find a job. And then I also ex would expect that a lot of those who would ordinarily be aging out are actually not going to be in a financial position to retire. So we might see some sort of pressure at the top. That, that, that's a very good point. The, the working age population, which is projected to grow at about three, and a, three quarters of a percent a year, is just simply the folks 16 and older, you know, 60 to, 16 to 100, uh, who are in the population. And therefore, you can get a labour force out of. And as you know, over the last few years, you've had a decline in the rate at which the population is participating in the labour force. Probably uh, since the late 1990s, that participation rate has come down for two main reasons. One is that that younger cohort, 16 to 24, is taking uh, advantage of education opportunities. I, I personally think the high tech boom of the late 90s and early 2000s motivated a higher proportion of 16 to 24 year olds uh, to stay at school and then get tertiary education and, and even further degrees. So that, that has taken away from that cohort of 16 to 24 year olds and, and that will probably stay at this new level of uh, lower percentage of 16 to 24 year olds that are coming into the labour force. That won't drop any further, it's already made its level change. Um, in term, terms of the older, older cohort, uh, that's going to continue simply because uh, 55 and older have only half the participation rate in the labour force than people aged 25 to 54. So they, only 40% of them are in the labour force versus 80% of others. Now actually during the recession, those older folks have actually stayed in the labour force longer, so that's provided a little bit of an offset. Uh, and, and probably that's going to stay where it is right now, uh, relatively elevated. although. It has to be said that as uh, the stock market and the housing market has improved, some of those folks who stayed on longer are now feeling more emboldened to start thinking about retirement, which essentially will open up some of the jobs for this 16 to 24 year old cohort who are still living with them basically. So uh, you know, I think over the next few years what, what you're going to see is still the participation rate uh, come down a little bit you're going to get some encouraged workers as the economy improves, uh, actually coming back and starting to look for a job, but the population's going to keep ageing. And what you end up with is a small net contraction in the growth of the labour force from those two offsetting forces. Um, the, the, so, you know, we, we are going to get uh, probably a relatively low rate of real growth over the next few years. So let's say it's 2% and you think that inflation ultimately is going to go to 2%, uh, you're probably looking at about 4% overall growth in the economy, in inflation inclusive, which is generally a bit below the long-term average simply because of this constrained uh, labour force. Um, the other challenge that we, can, we have is this uh, US budget deficit improvements uh, start to reverse. Uh, we get these rising age dependency ratios. Uh, as government makes changes to those, uh, behaviour of the elderly will change as they start to see potentially some of their expected future benefits uh, go away. Uh, the things that the government does now to affect um, future budget performance has an impact right now on our spending because we tend to spend based on a lifetime uh, concept of our income, not just what's happening this year. So that will tend to probably restrain growth as well over the next few years. Um, it's, it's probably reasonable to think that China's uh, appetite for commodities will dissipate in the years ahead. So we went through a decade where China's demand for commodities was growing twice the speed of its, its output, and its output was growing at 12% a year. Uh, we're gonna go, we, now in a period of China's <coughs> growth is probably half of 12% uh, by 2020. And the energy intensity of that uh, GDP will come down. So probably uh, commodities will tend to uh, come down somewhat in price. And that's, that's actually good news uh, for the economy because 
in, in the same way that China's appetite for commodities raised their real price and had an impact on economic activity here because China was taking up all the supply and raising the prices. That will tend to come off a little bit. So uh, again, the, the, to the, the overall assumption I think for the next 10 years is relatively slow real growth of the economy. Uh, it's hard to make a case really for too much uh, inflation beyond 2%, uh, particularly as commodity prices probably come down somewhat. Uh, and again, um, the what happens in the budget sector, because we still have out there looming this quite sharp increase in our debt ratios if we don't do anything, and if we do do something, it'll affect household and corporate behaviour. Uh, we have that looming. So I would say over the 10 years, probably relatively low growth with, uh, with inflation as well, whereas the three-year story is probably uh, somewhat above trend growth based on these positive supply shocks. <coughs> and uh, that's it. Is there any more questions about the, the, these economic assumptions? Okay, John, one, one last question basically. Sure. Is it, so is the 10-year environment good for the asset mix that CalPERS has? <laughs> well, look, I, I, you know, if, as an economist, what you'd be looking for is the stability of growth. Uh, which I think will, and, and, and the fact that we're looking for positive supply shocks in the economy, so you're not going to get demand going ahead of supply, uh, because all these uh, upside, potential upside surprises in the economy are, uh, are supply side. Uh, if you're looking at some of the constraints on growth, uh, being again this kind of bifurcated, um, uh, the, these bifurcated cohorts of people who are doing relatively well and others, which means the improvement's going to remain relatively slow. My personal view is, and now I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm getting on in age, but I would still be fairly long uh, personally risk assets because of, that, of, of the environment. Perfect. Any last questions for John? Excellent. All right, let's move on to the next uh, section, and we'll try to... Can you, can you pass the uh, clicker down? Okay, in this, in this section of the material, basically, we wanted to do a quick review of the asset class roles, uh, the capital market assumptions, and the constraints that have been applied in creating uh, potential candidate portfolios to try to bracket in our risk and return profile. Um, let's see. I this is an opportunity to really query the people and the, the senior people within the investment office about the things, in most particular about the constraints that have been um, added in many instances and, and very much drive the output of the optimization structure which creates the candidate portfolios. So I think without any further ado, let's just move right on to, uh, let me get to the section here. If we start at global equity, I think this is probably, oh, I don't know, potentially the least controversial asset segment in the portfolio. Um, there are, in essence, no constraints being applied to global equity. It is allowed to drift between zero and 100 percent of the uh, of the fund. So, in essence, global equity either provides capacity to any other asset segment uh, that would take capital and also absorbs capital from any segment that is, in essence, being constrained or giving up capital. You can see the assume rate of return and the volatility numbers. I don't think there's anything radically new about that. The role of equity is to really be the primary expression of economic growth risk in the portfolio. This is the, the biggest source of that risk uh, that is the overwhelming risk in the entire um, asset segment. Mr. Johansik? Well, I still think our capital market assumptions are too conservative. Uh, but the investment constraints Lower bound of zero, I mean, it's it's just a non-binding constraint. There are there are no constraints that actually bind the equity solution. If we run a completely unconstrained optimization um, on every asset segment in the portfolio, we would have a portfolio that uh, literally gets rid of actually all public equities, gets rid of all uh, public fixed income, has a very high weighting on private equity. It would buy private equity you know, and replace, replace public equities with private equity. Um, it has a high weighting on uh, infrastructure assets. Those are very attractive, both from their return characteristic and volatility profile. 
It would have a very high weighting on hedge funds, which in essence act as a substitute to the fixed income exposure in the portfolio, and it would maintain a fairly significant exposure to real estate assets, which again have an attractive return profile. So going from that sort of unconstrained world into the actual solutions that we can take um, is really a, a reflection of the constraint sets that get applied predominantly to those private assets. Uh, that ends up being the things that end up driving the portfolio exposures. I, I cannot see us ever adopting a portfolio that has no public equity in it. Yeah. Um, but what you're saying is the constraints we've imposed on others force us into the public. <laughs> that, that is exactly right. Exactly. I mean, when, with a private equity portfolio where we assume that we can generate approximately two to 300 basis points of incremental return, um, it, it, it takes on some additional volatility, but that return is enough to basically dominate any return that we assume comes out of the public equity exposure. So it's the constraints that, that push equity and fixed income back into the, into the portfolio. And if, if we put a lower bound of, say, 40%, it really wouldn't make any difference? It, it's not a constraining just feature. Else. Well, with, when we get to eventually to the candidate portfolios, you'll see, I think there may be one portfolio there, Ben, where the public equity exposure drops below 40%, right? Yes, so the first low-risk portfolio was okay. 38%. All right. Are there any questions, though, for, for Dan or for consultants or anyone else related to the public equity assumptions and, that have been on here? As, a, as I say, I think this is the potentially the least interesting uh, area to talk about. All right. Let's move on. I prefer least controversial area to talk about. <laughs> you like controversial? <laughs> okay. Private equity. <clears throat> Private equity is the first place where we actually see an investment constraint. Uh, the asset class has recommended a constraint on the private equity exposure. Uh, you can see the, uh, the constraint that has been applied. Excuse me, I'm looking at real estate. 12%. Um, that's 2% under our current target allocation level. I mean, in large measure, this has been driven by the actual um, ability to source and, and deploy capital with sort of top tier funds. I think that they're trying not to basically be forced to deploy capital into funds that they really don't think end up being in the right end of the distribution. You can see the return assumption, the, vol the volatility assumption is also increased from public equities, partly because we don't think you can get this excess return without taking some kind of risk, however that ends up being expressed. And the way risk is expressed in the mean variance world is, again, by variance and volatility. The, attached in the appendix, we have some information on the pacing models of private equity. I don't know if that is something you would like to flip to or if you have questions for Sarah um, from the private equity team or any of the consultants again. Alan? Yeah. I, I understand why for modeling you would use zero as a lower bounds, but practically you couldn't unwind that portfolio if you wanted to. So isn't putting that zero in deceiving and, and not really reflective of what would happen in the portfolio? Yeah, I, th I think it certainly could be argued that, Alan, but again, it's, it's a non-binding constraint. So you're right. I mean, we could, we could have placed that constraint at, you know, 8% or 10% or something of that nature, but... It ends up the optimization wants private equity in virtually every um, aspect of it. So we've, we've tended to more concentrate on what ends up be the, being the binding side of the constraint instead of the, the non-binding aspect of that. But point taken, I think. It just, just briefly to mention around optimizations, though, I would say to Mr. Jelensik's point and also, of course, Mr. Rampin, your question, fewer constraints is better on an optimization, right? So. If we don't have to put an, a constraint in, we try to avoid it, thus the 0, 100 for equity, not putting in a, a lower bound, but, but putting in what we do think is going to be a binding constraint on the private equity. This, this definitely, this constraint, though, has one of the potential biggest impacts on the, on the return profile of the fund. Ms. Mather? Yeah, it, it would be helpful to get a sense of what the capital market assumptions were last time we did it. Just so we can, and, and what has changed? Um, as, has as, far, as far as, as far as, I don't, I'm not sure that the actual capital market assumptions have changed very much. 
in the respect that we're assuming approximately 300 basis points of excess return on top of public equities. And the return to public equities, I think, is almost identical to what we had in the 2010 yes. uh, so, assumptions. Yeah, so from my uh, recollection, uh, the expected return uh, went up a little bit. And the volatility, I remember, in 2010 for private equity was 26%, and now it's 25%. So it's almost no change. OK, thank you. Maybe if you could just, as you go through these, um, these uh, asset classes, you could just mention, what, if you remember, <laughs> what, yeah, what it was last time around. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions about private equity? Mr. Johansson? The zero cash yield, I mean, I understand how early very early in the program at zero. But we've now gotten to the point where we are getting some realizations. Um, is a zero yield really a valid assumption given where our portfolio is? And the volatility, uh, do we have any sense how much of that volatility it is due to actual volatility of the portfolio? As and how much is impacted by the infrequency of measurement? Yeah, I think, well, the volatility measure that you see, the 25% is an estimate. But we do not observe that degree of volatility in the actual pricing of private equity funds. So this, this gets into this sort of chicken or egg question that we constantly have about the use of the risk model, where we proxy um, volatilities in from observable public market price securities on top of the types of positions that are contained in portfolios like the private equity segment. The 25 percent is literally, it's a constraint or it's an element that's put in there to just try to keep it from being completely irrational chasing the excess return that is attached to private equity. It's in essence a penalty function that, that serves to dampen the desire to just allocate money endlessly to it. It's basically substituted to some extent by the maximum constraint that's put into the portfolio. The other element that turns that tends to increase the estimates that come from, from virtually every source on private equity is the fact that there's additional leverage attached on top of what you observe in the in the publicly traded equity market. That leverage has an effect basically on the potential to create economic volatility. Whether or not that be is observed or not is an, is another question. And the zero yield? Zero yield. I think that's mostly a reflection of what we think we can systematically extract from it. So in other words, the equity returns or the, the, the capital returns that happen from private equity happen in certain market environments. So we've had a fairly buoyant public equity market and they've been realizing those sales either through initial public offerings or flipping securities between them. That could certainly change in an environment where, for example, if the market sells off, those managers are not going to be wanting to sell those assets. So I think it's the instability and the, you know, the lack of dependability or being able to time when those uh, returns would be generated and paid back to investors that cause it to have an assumed zero yield, even though that has not, obviously not been the case for the last couple of years. And Sarah, would yeah. you agree I would with just that? add to that, um, if you look at the uh, slide a few farther in the appendix, it does show that the, ca the portfolio would be cash flow positive in a 12% allocation and would be um, slightly cash flow negative for a few years in a 14% allocation. Is that, is that so in the pacing the model, Sarah? Correct. So why don't I just flip to the pacing slide? So the, so the f negative in 14 is because we would be putting additional money in to get to it. A larger capital commitments in the yeah. years would make it negative, yes. Okay, thank you. The pacing slides are on page 26 of the material. There's actually two of them. One basically um, targeting a 12% allocation, and the other is a pacing slide that would be indicative of trying to maintain a 14% allocation and the amount of money that would have to be being committed within the private equity area. Uh, the slide that you see on the screen right now is pertinent to the 12% a number, and you can see as Sarah pointed out, the cash flow numbers that are being reflected on the bottom of the, uh, the chart in the yellow. So it does expect that over time this thing would end up generating some kind of cash, but I think, again, the timing and the receipt of that is virtually unforecastable. So I don't think that that's money that you would want to plan on being able to spend at any point in time. And it's money that eventually gets recommitted into new investments, basically. <coughs> 
we flip to the next slide in the pacing model, you can see the significantly higher uh, contributions. Uh, er oh, Eric, I, I think you, you've made a good point. Th this is maybe one of the most, not maybe, this is the most significant change uh, in the uh, portfolios in terms of return. And I think if we could ask Sarah to explain some of the logic of moving from 14 to 12, uh, since all of the uh, portfolios on offer currently uh, take that 12% binding constraint and keep uh, and keep to it. Sarah? Sure. sure. So um, a couple different rationale for doing it. Um, at the 12%, it's a more consistent commitment to the market, so it's roughly $6 billion a year consistently, as opposed to the 14% where the commitments um, uh, are a little more volatile and end up at more around the $10 billion per year in the outer years, which has two impacts. One, the ability to deploy capital at the expected return gets more difficult. And two, the unfunded commitments in the outer years grow from a steady 17% to growing to between 23 and $24 billion in the outer years. So if liquidity is a concern, that the higher unfunded uh, could become problematic. Would it, would it be fair to say that in, in, in simple terms, given the amount of money we have, the size of the portfolio, the opportunity set, uh, is such that as you move up above 12, the return potential, the portfolio degrades because the quality of managers declines or the dependence yeah. on particular strategies? The dependence on large asset managers uh, or an overly diversified portfolio would both uh, lead to an exp a lower expected return. Right. Yeah. Mr. Jones. Is, is the lower expected return in that asset class enough to overcome the expected, the reduced expected return for the portfolio as a whole? Did, did that question, did I make, was the question at all clear? Well, yeah. What we give up to drop from 14 to 12 is made up by the actual better real return from the portfolio because of its quality. That's not built into the model. I'm, yeah, I'm it, right. it, it is not built into the model. I think, you know, the expectation has been that private equity has attracted enough capital in the last decade, basically, that even the 300 basis points on top of public markets is a serious question. Um, the asset class themselves were thinking that a 200 basis point margin is probably potentially more applicable. So it's, it's this, and I don't think anyone really knows where those numbers are, Mr. Jelensic, but it's sort of, you know, that is one of the dilemmas is that as you basically are trying to deploy capital, at some point you really are, are going to force yourself to deploy capital into managers that are going to end up on the wrong end of the return distribution where they don't even generate a return equal to the public equity markets. Because that certainly happens, I think, once you get down below the median level um, within the asset segment. So you, to obtain the benefit, you really have to be able to deploy capital just into those top tier managers whether it's top quartile or somewhere within the top 50%, I think in order to achieve the benefit that you think you're gonna get from the asset segment. I think that ends up being one of the biggest challenges to the, to the team that works on this um, in private equity is how much capital can they really deploy to those, those top tier managers before they're forced to just putting, be putting capital into less attractive funds. And that that's, ends up being the trade-off. I don't think anyone knows exactly where the right number is for that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, let's, uh, so anyway, private equity is one significant change to this. We flip back to inflation assets, infrastructure, real estate. Okay, global fixed income. This is another area where we basically have um, changed slightly the constraints and uh, you'll see two scenarios in the potential candidate portfolios, one with global fixed income um, with a 15% constraint and another with uh, using an 18% constraint. So there's basically two scenarios. The reason for the 15% constraint is if we really wanted to drive to a higher return portfolio, we basically cannot do it and maintain our current exposure to fixed income. We would have to let that exposure drop, drop below the uh, current levels. It is believed that should we reduce the allocation to liquidity, 
that potentially some of that allocation could f filter into either fixed income or it could filter into potentially ARS and the hedge fund portfolio. Um, in large measure, the con binding constraint on fixed income is the lower constraint. It's the floor. This asset segment has the lowest expected return uh, basically outside of the liquidity asset um, of any in the entire um, opportunity set. So therefore, unless you're really constrained on risk, you basically are going to try to reduce the fixed income exposure if you, again, if you just ran an unconstrained optimization. The expected return on the asset segment, you can see the, uh, it is slightly below the actual yield level that is assumed, which infers a, a, some degree of capital loss should interest rates move up over the horizon, basically, of the forecast um, estimate, which is a 10-year a 10-year set of expectations. So part of the capital loss issue attached to rising interest rates is built into the, into the numbers on this. And these numbers have been adjusted, though, for the shift in yield levels in the marketplace that took place earlier this year and have just pretty much been maintained uh, through the current time period. Are there questions for Curtis or the fixed income folks or consultants on, on this asset segment? Okay. Real estate. Real estate is an area, uh, that basically the, the constraint on real estate that ends up being binding is the upper constraint, the upper bound. Uh, we currently, our allocation in real estate is 9%. That is a shift down from sort of a 10% target. Uh, that was an interim step, basically, as real estate has been restructuring their program. Uh, Ted and the real estate team believe that they can let that, let that constraint drift up to an 11 percent target. They think that that will be achievable, you know, within the next year or two, I think, hopefully in the portfolio, unless the equity, public equity portfolio continues to run to the moon. <laughs> it may become more of a, more of a struggle. Uh, you can see the relatively attractive return at 7 percent and the volatility. Uh, the cash yield number hopefully is something that would increase a bit over time as the portfolio restructures more into core real estate and away from some of the opportunistic stuff that has been the legacy. But uh, these are the numbers that are being applied to real estate. So this is one place where the asset class is content with moving the constraint upwards. Other questions for Ted? Anybody on that? Okay. Infrastructure and forest land. Um, Infrastructure and forest land, I think, is, again, th this ends up being a very attractive asset from the perspective of the, an optimization and from the asset allocation perspective due to, again, having an, a, a virtually identical 7% return expectation to real estate. What you see, though, is that it has a reduced volatility, so it drops the volatility estimate down from 14% to 11%. And I believe that if we flip to the correlation matrix, which is the very last page of the attachments, or the appendix, rather, I think that, uh, yeah, well, yes, actually, the correlation between infrastructure and forest land relative to equities is a 0.27 in contrast to a 0.37, so it actually appears to be a more diversifying asset. So this becomes a very attractive segment uh, potentially to invest in. The challenge has been to actually acquire assets at these kinds of assumed characteristics. And that has been a challenge that is, we have not, I think, really figured out exactly how to make that happen. We have Mr. Emkin. To be consistent, when we went through asset allocation at the smaller fund across the river, uh, <laughs> They looked at something that was 1 or 2 percent, and I need to be consistent. And I said, if you're only going to do 1 or 2 percent, you shouldn't do it at all. Because statistically, it really does not move the needle. Uh, you're looking at a basis point in one direction or another, and there's resources, there's time, there's oversight. <clears throat> Why do it? And, and I would urge the committee to say, is it worth doing? if it's not going to have a meaningful impact. I don't care how interesting it is. Yeah. I think that's a perfectly <laughs> salient observation. Ms. Moffat? So is the upper bound really because of what we think we can achieve? I and mean, we've had a really slow start to infrastructure. Um, we haven't seen a lot of opportunities that we felt we could bid on and be successful. So is that really what's driving the 2%? That, that's exactly right. I mean, I, we think until we figure out a model that either or the market changes basically that uh, we just cannot acquire the assets, and I th the, the challenge then becomes one of 
in the asset allocation, if we basically build numbers into the asset allocation that we can't achieve, we just are building in tracking variants at that point that can't be managed. So it's a question of, I think, until we find the right model, if you will, to actually be able to acquire these assets, you know, the people are, the, the, the investment office has been in favor of a constrained allocation, not with, you know, not ignoring the comment I think that Alan Emkin just made. I think that's a totally salient comment. Unless we think we can figure this out, it's probably not worth doing if we, if we can't do it for more than this. So is it really our own internal model? I'm, Ted, I'll let you talk, talk, but is it really our own internal model or sort of where the market is today, but we think it's going to improve? What, what, is, our, what is the outlook? Yeah, I think the, a good page to look at is the infrastructure pacing forecast. So if you turn to, uh, someone can just flip all the way into the appendix and take a look at that. A um, couple more, you're almost there. There it is. Oh, come back, come back one. <laughs> Um, so one, the first point is infrastructure is a relatively new asset class, so not a lot of experience set, not a lot of other, certainly U.S. pension funds with portfolios to, to look at that experience, so you want to be careful in mm -hmm. how you implement the program. Um, number two, we did just start up the program, so we now have 10 to 12 you know, investment professionals in infrastructure. We have all our governance in place now from policies and strategic plans. So those, those things do take time. To, you, need, you need to have them before you can actually execute. Uh, but those are now in place. So now you turn to this chart and uh, looking at um, if you wanted to maintain a 2% a allocation, what we found is if you look at the vintage year capital invested, investing about a billion to a billion four, over the time horizon, you would at the very end of, uh, you know, into the 2017, 2018 period be able to achieve a 2%. And what we felt is that would be too aggressive a, a target to put, you know, more than a billion dollars of investment into the ground in order to, to get to your target at the end of the, uh, end of the cycle. So rather than having an aggressive target of 2%, have a more mar moderate target of 1%. If there are market opportunities, if we actually do see the opportunities, we have been bidding on quite a number and if they have not met our investment um, uh, uh, return requirements. If there are, then we feel very comfortable and I think the senior investment uh, team, the CIO and ISG would be uh, very favorable for the infrastructure team to come in and, and have an over allocation, you know, move to a 2% uh, target at that time. But right now in the marketplace, we're not seeing the opportunities that we can ex um, execute on. Uh, I, I want to amplify that uh, and I want to ad ad address the infrastructure team which we've built. Uh, we are positioned to take advantage of this marketplace and if the opportunity set expands, we'll be able to move quickly to do that. And we'll be able to move not just through fun, uh, funds, but through a direct investment. So uh, we're all quite happy and prepared to come back to the committee and say, we're, we're gonna raise the uh, infrastructure target because there's, there's more to do here. But we don't wanna, uh, we, we're not prepared to lower our return expectations. So we're gonna continue to lose some bids and we don't want to have a target that we can't meet. So that's where we are. If, if it's a better, as I said, if it, there's is more out there uh, and we can get it, then we'll be back uh, saying let's raise the target, okay? Mr. Sweden. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, first of all, we had a chart earlier that showed the aging infrastructure. And uh, I, I think that if we, you know, this is, we're a long-term player. These are long-term projects. Um, I, I think the, the goal of whether it's one or two is ultimately too low, but you know, you've got to crawl before you can walk. Uh, I think that we're going to see some potential tax law changes coming in the next couple of years that are going to impact tax exempt financing, which has been a big blocking factor for pension funds to be able to be involved in these projects. So I think there's an opportunity here to take the number higher, but you know, when I look at the volatility and the return profile of these kind of deals, um, I, I think there's going to be more opportunities out there. I would ask uh, Alan, 
what, what percentage would work? What percentage would make it make sense? And, and by when would we have to get there for you to have a higher level of comfort? I hate tough questions. Um, <laughs> but I think the key to this, in my mind, is to put an asterisk and say, right now it's two. This is one of those where we might have a range that's pretty wide that if the opportunity presents itself, it ratchets itself up rapidly. And that way, you don't have to go back and change policy when the opportunity presents itself. And that would be my suggestion. Yeah. Well, I would agree with that one. Mr. Jones. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the investment strategy for uh, infrastructure is what they call brownfield. Yeah, they, te they tend not to be in greenfield investment mm -hmm. or brand new projects coming out of the ground. So okay. they like established projects and established uh, revenue streams. So if you were, if the policy, and I'm not suggesting we go to the Greenfield, the, the, but if they were, these numbers would, would change? Um, I, you know, I, I'd have to defer to the infrastructure people. Maybe Ted has a perspective I'd, I'd on that. I'd add um, a, couple, a couple, similar to the core versus opportunistic discussion mm -hmm. in real estate, the return and volatility and correlation assumptions that make it infrastructure so attractive really um, speak to the brownfield or defensive mm -hmm. operating assets. Mm -hmm. uh, the development or greenfield assets don't have any of the characteristics that are so attractive in this model. Mm -hmm. They do have return characteristics that are very attractive. So I think in order to add a significant component or change the strategy for infrastructure to have a more significant component for development or greenfield, mm -hmm. we'd need to adjust quite significantly the return and volatility and correlation assumptions that are in the model. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the public-private partnership uh, issue, would that make a difference if that was accelerated and all of a sudden as uh, Bill mentioned tax benefits to, uh, that may come about that would, may allow for more public-private partnerships. Uh, it certainly would be um, helpful if that model could be accelerated to allow uh, CalPERS and other pension fund investors to invest in, in, brown, you know, in, in operating assets. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the area that would be the most beneficial for CalPERS because that's exactly what this model and what the investment office is attracted to in infrastructure are those operating assets. Okay, thanks. Mr. Jolensic. Hi, Henry, I, I would encourage you to expect a call from PEG um, <coughs> about public-private partnerships. Um, the, I, I really like this asset class, um, but I have said both privately and publicly, I really hope that we maintain the discipline of not saying we have to be in this. If we cannot get the returns that we want and demand, then we should walk away from it. Uh, markets are cyclical. Uh, when you get too much money chasing them, the returns go down, and we should have discipline. Forest land, though, um, is actually one that I find has some real opportunities for us. At one point, we had a very big um, forest land project. Uh, when I look at our portfolio, we've got nothing in the northwest, nothing in the northeast. And if you told me I have a timber program with nothing in the northeast, nothing in the northwest, I wouldn't believe you. Um, so I'm wondering why we don't look at increasing that allocation and getting a more diversified portfolio and getting into the more traditional timber markets. Um, and, you know, timber is kind of a nice thing because if it, if there's no market for it, you let it grow, and it grows about 5% a year. Um, and if there is a market for it, you harvest it, and then you s throw off the cash. Um, I think you'll, you'll be seeing in the November, just in a week, uh, the Real Assets uh, Annual Program Review, and you've effectively summarized the forest land <laughs> uh, report that you'll be seeing there. I think... Uh, uh, in order to increase the diversification of the uh, forest land portfolio um, will require some fairly substantial purchases of, of um, assets in, in the Northeast and Pacific Northwest. And those opportunities are lumpy and, again, are, are experiencing some of the same pricing constraints that, um, that we see in the other real assets. So um, 
that's all to sum up for the ask for this purpose that the one percent target to forest land makes sense for the same reasons that you're hearing in infrastructure and and in real estate there's a wide enough range that's being applied and that's one of the main recommendations from the asset allocation group is to have a wide enough range around these private asset classes that should market opportunities avail themselves we have the flexibility to move into them you know but when we look at the vintage here capital invested it's zero you know from now until 18 and that isn't going to get us to the diversified portfolio i recognize that it, it's lumpy i mean you can't buy a tree um but i'm really wondering if we you know if we're allowing the allocation or lack of allocation to be a constraint on our ability to play in a market that's got some real appeal yeah no i don't think the allocation is constraining uh, what is what is constraining and, and should constrain us is uh, we do have some work to do. One, uh, we have to adopt a strategic plan for forest land, uh, which has not been done um, to date, and we need probably need to grow our staff beyond half of one person. Um, you mean Judy is, can't do it all? <laughs> so that's. Uh, I thought Judy was really good. Uh, so we have uh, we have some we have some work to do getting ourselves to the position that we can execute. Thank you. Yep. Okay, there are other questions in relation to infrastructure forest land. All right, let me <laughs> flip back again here. Okay, inflation assets. And I would remind you that basically inflation assets are inflation-linked bonds and commodities. Uh, currently, I believe that our allocation is 75 percent ILBs and 25 percent commodities. Uh, there's a 2 percent uh, lower bound that's being applied on this, right? That's correct, Ben? And that is our constraining, uh, that's our constraining feature. You see the return characteristics and volatility characteristics, you know, obviously make this a low return, relatively uh, somewhat less attractive asset, although, albeit that we need we believe inflation protection in the portfolio. Are there particular questions about that segment? Okay, let's move forward. Liquidity. Okay, so we had the liquidity discussion earlier today, and and again, liquidity is going to be driven by its lower boundary. Um, the staff recommendation at this point has been a two percent number. Uh, certainly, Mr. McGuire, for example, made an articulation. You know that maybe two percent is too much. Um, still, and there's an opportunity cost uh, attached to this, and you can see that opportunity cost is the, really the 2% return number, albeit at a fairly low volatility um, that is attached to this, and predominantly all of that <coughs> return comes from the expectation of yield on the asset segment. And I would be curious if there's further questions or discussion that would like to happen around the liquidity allocation. Mr. Jelensic. If the inflation assets are largely tips um, how do they interact with the liquidity um, because you know tips are you know as far as I understand they're highly liquid uh, readily convertible into cash um, so and he's saying no so. no it's not yet um, but the markets for so these are linkers so a third of the program is Global, um, and uh, two thirds of the linkers are U.S. tips. It's not like U.S. Treasuries. Um, there are times when they're more liquid than others. Uh, you can trade them, but they're not like Treasuries. Um, and the linkers, the the international section is more tricky. So these you would not want to use these during a crisis. So trying to sell tips during a crisis, it'll be challenging. Um, the only things that do well during the crisis, at least the 2008 crisis in fixed income, treasuries, believe it or not, and mortgage pass-throughs were probably even more liquid than treasuries. Treasuries, um, <laughs> as liquid as they, you, they are, they're there's a lot of technicals that are go on, and it's not as easy to sell billions at a time. It just takes time. So I would not recommend uh, 
substituting tips or any of those for your liquid assets. Okay. It just and takes time to get rid of it. And we'll do it offline, but pass-throughs are not what I would have expected to be liquid. I know. <clears throat> so Let me tell We can talk about that. I'll, I'll tell you, it's just yeah. over the last, it's surprising. This is the argument I had with our past asset allocation person. They are extremely liquid. During crisis, it's unbelievable. You can do billions and the markets don't even move. Mr. Jones? It's kind of related to that it, because you indicate the role is to provide effective risk protection during financial crisis. So my question is, how did it perform during the 2008-09 crisis? Ben, do you have an answer for that one? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I believe you're referring to this slide. Curtis was talking about uh, the previous slide uh, respond to Jay, uh, uh, Mr. Janessa's question using tips as a liquidity. Uh, this slide is a liquidity liquidity. So we have this 2%. We have had a 4% liquidity allocation with uh, three third, uh, no, uh, uh, three quarters of in uh, two to uh, uh, 10 year treasury securities and uh, 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 one quarter of in uh, liquid cash. So the two to 10 year treasury security during the uh, 2008 uh, uh, security lending crisis, the liquidity maintained uh, very well. Not as well as the three months TBOs, but it was one of the most uh, liquid uh, securities. So you're saying that it, it did honor its role? Yes, yes it and did. And so what was the correlation uh, with, for this uh, asset class? So this asset class is the only one broke out with the rest of the pack. The rest of the pack, the correlation went to one. And the only one has a negative correlation is the Treasury Securities had a neg negative correlation with the rest of the uh, portfolio. And that's how it provided a uh, diversification benefit. Okay. Yeah, we, we are not assuming a negative correlation in the actual modeling of optimal portfolios. I think we assume a 0.2 correlation. So we, we almost never will, are willing to model actually a negative correlation. So that just seems unsustainable potentially so that yeah, that can lead you to some really interesting solutions. But that's, that's one of the assumptions in this. But just to put it in the simplest terms possible, in 2008, treasuries were the only asset, forget the correlation stuff, only asset which went up, that had a positive return. Real estate equities, everything else fell. This treasury is not only were liquid, but they were your only asset which actually held water to had positive performance. Mortgage pastures went up too. I mean, I'm telling you. <laughs> Okay, are there other questions? Priya? Beginning. This morning when we were talking about liquidity and cash, um, you, you, I think you implied that there might, you might, that staff might have some appetite to even go lower than 2%, but you've, you're recommending a lower bound of 2%. Can you just talk about that? I mean, I'm not encouraging you to go lower, but I just, <laughs> I just want to hear your thoughts on it, or staff's thoughts on it a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think a part of the 2% number is basically to retain what we think is an adequate buffer to help the whole financial office understand, you know, how liquidity gets managed. So instead of just lurching right from a bunch of liquidity reserve, if you will, to nothing in a liquidity reserve, while they're basically trying to build out their function and we're trying to figure out the roles and responsibilities between the investment office and the financial office, I think that this is just an interim step that takes us to a place where it's still comfortable, but we're not, you know, we're not putting them in a position where they have to, um, attest to the ability to manage the liquidity issue. And by the way, we just pulled away a 4% buffer out of that. So I think that that potentially could put, put Cheryl and the CFO and the whole financial office in kind of a stress situation that it's not clear that that's appropriate or not. I think from the investment office perspective, I mean, we certainly are content even with a 2% target to the extent that there's a range around that target, if we believe the market is accommodative, we can we will drift drift below that range. We have been below the four percent range um, many times over the last couple of years, basically, just depending on how we view market conditions. So as long as there's a range around that, we can manage the issue. I think we're pretty much equally comfortable because if we think the market requires us to increase liquidity, we're going to increase it almost regardless, as long as again there's a range. I think this morning you said that you could go as low as zero is, is the b bottom of the range. I guess I wouldn't, I, that doesn't make me feel very comfortable. Yeah. I'd rather see 1% as the bottom of the range. Yeah, and, and the range right now is 1 to 7. Just, okay, just so to be clear, so it's not zero currently. And so I, I, 
I guess this will come out in staff's recommendations ultimately as a result of the work we do tomorrow. Um, but you, you ex expect it to also be something similar to that one to one to seven. Yeah. I mean, we could we could just retain the existing range with no with no change. There's it, you know it's not required. Okay. Thanks. So sure. if I can just add to Please. that too. So I think um, range is important. So that gives us the ability to to have uh, that buffer. But also uh, to Eric's point, we're very comfortable because we've done the modeling around what uh, what the. Uh, cash needs are they're fairly stable in terms of the making sure that we meet the benefit uh, requirements but what we haven't built out and this is this is the work that the investment office and the financial office have to do together is uh, breaking down those silos within those asset class classes to really understand what those those cash requirements are so that's that's the work that we'll get to to do in order to be able to really uh, really um, target what should that that two percent, but because it is just a target and we have that range, that's I think that's the important thing to, to consider. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jelancic. Did I hear you say that you would be willing to go below the range? Below the range? Well, we can't go below the range out of, without coming back to the investment committee. Okay, <laughs> okay. below the target. Below the target, okay. but, but potentially okay. so, depending on the opportunities and how we, and how the market is viewed. Absolutely. Okay, I just the guy was fingernails on the blackboard. Thank you. Any other comments in relation to liquidity, Mr. McGuire? I'm thinking you have a comment, but you're not making it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm looking forward to uh, next month's report, possibly an analysis by staff relative to three liquidity items, yeah. um, corporate uh, liquidity facility, and, and in relation to the uh, securities lending, significant liquidity that is available, plus the equity. And I don't think we can make any assessment of what liquidity should be until we have that information. Oh, Dan? Just, just to draw one quick distinction, and I've been kind of uh, biting my tongue on this one all day, but since we're kind of managing a portfolio here, what we're doing is managing a portfolio. This is something that I work with all my portfolio managers on, is that there is a distinction to be made between liquidity and exposure. So saying a 1% or a 2% target to the liquidity asset class, that's an exposure target that we want to target that. That doesn't mean that that's all the liquidity that we have. You know, as stated before, that we could have a line of credit in place, we have the synthetic ability, we have SEC lending. So um, the manufacturing of liquidity er, as can be, you know, differentiated between, as I say, the sort of the how much liquidity you have access to, i.e., can you clear a check, as opposed to what kind of exposure do you want to the liquidity asset class. And the 1% to 2% is really to keep a constant buffer in there so we don't feel like we're constantly having to manage the liquidity while we're building the facility. And then potentially we could drop to a, to a zero to the extent that we have the ability, or even maybe 10 basis points, because we certainly have sort of constraints around leverage, but we would want to, we could get ourselves to a place where we were almost zero while having some, you know, means to access liquidity. Yeah, that, that's why it would be useful to have a sense of what that capacity is. <laughs> right now, we don't really have a good, a good sense of that, so. Yeah, we can, we'll, we'll be bringing you that information back without a doubt. Okay, any other commentary? Mr. McGuire, are you done now? <laughs> it's okay. No, point, point taken. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Absolute return strategies, another one of our more interesting categories. Uh, the, the candidate portfolios that you'll see in a few minutes that uh, ben, ben and Alan will be presenting, we, we in essence have modeled with two boundary conditions attached to ARS. Uh, one is a 2% target, another is a 5% target. Uh, ARS is a relatively attractive asset. It acts as a substitute to fixed income in many instances. You can see the return numbers and the volatility numbers. Um, in the way that the program is being managed basically make that relatively a higher returning asset segment without uh, lots and lots of additional risk. Albeit though, the correlation with ARS that ARS maintains uh, to the equity asset class is increased from uh, the fixed income asset. So the in fixed income asset has a lower correlation, so it provides a bit of more of a diversification component. But this is an area that we really 
would like to get some feedback on as to you know where is the members of the investment committee stand in relation to hedge funds. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that you don't have um, any scenario that brings it below two percent. I'm just curious. It's, it seems like we've had sort of a range of conversations about it, whether we should stay where we are, whether we should drop it, or whether we should increase it. But you're, you've only brought us to keep it where it is and increase it. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in large measure, what we've been trying to do is create an actual allocation. If we're going to have hedge funds, create an actual allocation to it, because it's just not clear how it fits in with any of the other existing segments of the portfolio because its behavior is idiosyncratic enough that it really just doesn't look like equities or it doesn't look like fixed income. Um, it would be anticipated that ARS would have a range around it just like every other asset allocation does so that there's basically room to, to maneuver and room to move it around. You don't either want to be forcing money into the market or forcing money out of the market as the denominator of the value of the fund is bouncing around in large measure due to the public equity uh, volatility, if you will, in the portfolio. So our, our staff recommendation has been a 2% number basically maintaining the asset segment pretty much right where it is as Ed and his team restructure and build the program into the characteristics that they've been targeting. Uh, Joe asked us to put a 5% threshold in there. That has been done in relation to a relatively low return portfolio. That 5% number could be done in a higher return portfolio as well. But it would basically be substituting some fixed income exposure for, for ARS type exposure. But I think that literally it could be, you know, we'll, we'll have, you'll have an opportunity tomorrow uh, to go through the clicker exercise and decide whether you would rather us take these constraints and move them in one direction or another and by how much. So that's certainly something that you can give us feedback for tomorrow when we get through that part of the analysis. But, you know, this is, this is just sort of the base cases that we've started with. Okay. Yeah, and, and, uh, if I may add, uh, later on you will see uh, among one of the preliminary candidate <coughs> portfolios, well, of the higher return portfolio does not have any allocation to ARS. So the full range of it will have allocation from, uh, for ARS from 5% uh, uh, to uh, zero. OK. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, Eric, is this a separate asset class? We, we haven't defined ARS as an asset class. We're basically calling it a program. And it's partly because of some of the baggage around this organization and in the definition of asset classes. Um, in, the same, in the same aspect, you know, I, I mean, for example, is infrastructure forest land an asset class? It is a separate asset allocation, but it is run within the real assets um, component. So I would describe that as being a program. You know, so it's, in essence, we've taken real assets and we've broken it between real estate and infrastructure and forest land. So we've kept those two things basically separate, although they're run within the same kind of construct. Part of that sort of structuring issue, I think, exists with ARS as well. So it's not clear to us that it demonstrates, in essence, stable enough characteristics as anything. There is no stable characteristic to ARS. In other words, it depends on what Ed and his team allocate the money to. They could allocate it into an equity strategy, in which case it looks like public equities. They could go into fixed income, and it could be a long or a short exposure. So there's, there's not necessarily a stability of characteristic. I think there can be a stability of aspiration as to what you want to have those characteristics be, but there is no asset that you can buy that will deliver those characteristics with absolute certainty, for example, like a coupon <laughs> payment on a bond. So I think that's what partly causes this consternation as to whether this is an asset class or whether it is simply just a separate allocation into something that is, in essence, really underpinned by trading strategies. Right. So since, since um, the strategies are not homogenous at all, if you recall, back in February, the committee approved the strategic plan, which set out how we would manage it. So what were, what were going to be the, the risk? The volatility, the return, the, car, the, the beta drawdown and um, aspects, and that's what we're managing to. But just a reminder, so today, 
actually ARS still sits within global equity and has an equity overlay. So it is kind of like a portable alpha, just like we do with the, um, with the CLO structure. So what we're saying is in, in this um, exercise, um, ARS program will have its own capital allocation. That, that benchmark will be part of the overall fund benchmark. Um, and so it'll, it'll have, if we keep it the way it is today, it'll have a 2% allocation with a range around it. And so uh, looking at the role here, and it says the diversifier to equity risk, and again, um, using Ben's uh, soup analogy, that uh, th this is, the, the, we, how is it diversifying when it has the same kind of risk as the equity? Right now it's not. No, right now, today, it, is, it acts as equity because there's an there's a overlay on the program. Uh, I believe it's now down to half half the program, right? It's, it's one percent left. So what we're saying is, when we when we complete the um, asset allocation strategic asset allocation process, and if it has its own allocation, then we will remove the overlay completely, and it will act then as a separate program with with those characteristics. Uh, Mr. Jones, to your question. So uh, I had mentioned something about the overlay program. So once we take off, say, take out the over the effect from the overlay program, uh, the target for ARS program to deliver a beta or the correlation uh, with the equity market beta, is the target is 0 0.2. And historically speak, uh, speaking, there are some periods that we uh, the program or the hedge fund industry uh, collectively have delivered that beta, and there are some periods that you know the industry has not been able to deliver that kind of a, a diversification benefit that we are looking for. Well, yeah, and, um, but the overall market's not managed to deliver a .2 or less beta, which our program will be, so I'm confident that we can do that. Uh, and there you see that even among the staff, there's not a <laughs> unified uh, view of hedge funds. Uh, I, a comment from members, and I wanted to make another observation. I think, I think we have Mr. McGuire. So, Joe, would you sort of express from your perspective why 5% and what the implications might be? It, it's the Emkin advice. If you're going to do it, do it at a scale where it makes a difference. And 2.5% uh, is not significant on the overall portfolio. Interestingly, at $5.5 billion, it would be a good standalone hedge fund to funds business. So there's enough scale in it. Uh, requires a team to manage it, and Ed's been doing a very good job building it. But it, if, if we, if it succeeds in the intent we have defined for it, as a diversifier away from growth risk, then it probably makes sense to expand it. But that case is not proved yet for us, so we need some time to do that, and we can do that at the current level of, of the allocation or something close to it. Alan, did you have a comment? <clears throat> Just on the issue of whether or not it's an asset class. <laughs> Compared to everything else in the portfolio, you can pick up a piece of timber, you can pick up an equity, you can pick up a bond, you can't pick up, in quote, a hedge fund. You're buying active management. That's what hedge funds are. And it's just important to recognize that. And you pay a lot to get the benefit of what your staff and a lot of people believe are the best minds in the business to give you good risk-adjusted rates of return but you're not buying an asset class. And it's just really, really important to recognize that you're buying active management. And, and so you gotta believe it, and you gotta pay for it, uh, and, uh, and it's, got to be, uh, it's got to be shown through in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the actual results that the portfolio produces. But it is a set of active management strategies, and the task is to fashion a portfolio uh, with highly skilled managers who can uh, persistently produce uh, good returns. And, you know, I, obviously I think we can because we've got it in the portfolio, uh, but uh, the, the case has to be proved. One year's good return with a new leader uh, is insufficient to, uh, to, to, to do that. 
Um, but this role is uh, really important, this diversification away from uh, growth risk. Another way of thinking of that is it's a volatility reducer, uh, but without giving up return. And uh, there's a limit to how much we can do that. Uh, but given what you saw from this morning on the discussion of the nature of the portfolio and the risks in it, uh, a strategy which does produce lower volatility, uh, less uh, market correlation uh, without degrading return, uh, is, is a valuable tool in the, in the portfolio of the fund. <coughs> Mr. Bilbray? So what would it look like if we did zero and we didn't do it at all? What would the picture be then if we didn't go into that round? I'm sorry, sir. Could you? What would happen if we didn't do? If we had a zero percent, we didn't. We didn't go into that. You know, I th I think at that point in time that if it was done at zero, basically, I don't think Joe and I don't think the investment office are in favor of abandoning the effort that Ed and his team are working on. So I think we would do it as an active risk within the investment program, and let them continue to prove out the efficacy of what they're building, basically. But it would end up being a risk that is attached entirely to the staff at that well, point. Well, then it would go back to the way it was. It would, it, we would finance it with an overlay. But the strong intent is that we've taken half the overlay off, and the uh, strong intent is to take the other half off uh, in due course so that it does become an allocation. That gives, and by putting an allocation, that gives the board the control over what's doing rather than putting it in an opportunistic uh, mode and, and then letting us decide whether we want to take that active risk. By that I mean whether we're going to uh, put hedge funds in thinking they're going to help the performance of the fund and then help us beat a benchmark or not. Um, th there's an important note here, just uh, it's, it's m more, it's a staff concern, not a, a board concern, but we really have invested a lot in uh, building up the team. And so to go to zero, bef uh, you know, to say to zero it out, you know, we got a guy we've been recruiting, I don't know, for eight or nine months. We've been trying to get a, a due diligence and, and uh, operation, operational due diligence expert. And if they hear we're, you know, seriously thinking about not doing this, then forget it, you know. <coughs> and then the, the people that we've got, and we've really brought some wonderful folks uh, we'll also start polishing their resumes to get out. So it's not just, it's not theoretical, and that's why I'm sort of speaking more about this. We, I realize we said we're not making recommendations, we're not, um, but there, there are consequences here. But if you ask the question, Mr. Bilbray, could we run the portfolio without hedge funds? Yeah, we could. Uh, could we run a, a better portfolio? Perhaps. We'd like to find out if, if that's true. Mr. Jelancic. So the discussion is really about whether hedge funds or the absolute return strategies ought to be part of the benchmark. I, I think it, in large measure that's a lot, because a lot of the question. What I'm hearing is we're going to we're going to do hedge funds no matter what, uh, unless short of direction not to do it. Um, and so it's really about whether it's in the benchmark. And in terms of Alan's comment that hedge fund, you know, you can't. You know, you can pick up a piece of timber, you can pick up a stock certificate, you can't pick up a hedge fund. Uh, I, he's right, but a hedge fund can certainly pick your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, that reminds me, the, the, the Economist uh, magazine, they call themselves a newspaper, uh, famously uh, defined hedge funds as a compens uh, compensation scheme masquerading as an asset class. <laughs> And that may be what it really Quite fundamentally accurate. is. Quite accurate. <laughs> Are there other observations or comments or questions in relation to this? And again, we'll we'll query you back on the constraints that have been applied. I mean, if if the intent, you know, if the, you can express the point of view that you have about where it should get, you know, what allocation it should receive, and should it receive an allocation, that'll be an opportunity. Can I just Please. I'd just like to say, back to a point that Ms. Mother made earlier this morning, with respect to the, the speed at which low volatility is evaluated, there could be some sort of overlapping um, impacts on the portfolio by the inclusion of low volatility in the equity portfolio and the role that ARS plays. And so I think that um, the, the quicker that can come back uh, uh, appropriately, well-researched, 
it may have some impact on your decision to allocate in size to ARS. Because if you, if you compare, the, both are to, to reduce equity risk, but if you compare the cost uh, and the complexity, I, I think you'll say that low volatility equity certainly has the advantages there. I, I don't, uh, I'd have to disagree. I don't think that yep. low vol equity reduces your equity risk. That's an interesting statement. So De lo definitionally, it, 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 that's what? the it, purpose. It, it's 100% equities. It's beta. Structured around a risk target. I mean, it, it's... The, okay. This is this is why we'll low volatility equity <laughs> isn't coming right now. <laughs> First and foremost, I mean this this indicates the the, stru the the struggle that we've had to sort of define it ourselves, and and I, that's not unusual. Yeah, the um, hedge, hedge guy likes hedge funds. Is that what I heard? I, th I think that may be what he said. But the hedge guy doesn't like equities. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoa. Um, from, a, from an asset allocation perspective, though, we actually see the hedge fund program as being more of a substitute for fixed income ex type exposure than we do for actually equity exposure. You know, and again, it's because of the way that Ed is defining the aspirations that they have behind the program is to delink it as much from equity as possible. And honestly, our, our most diversifying asset that we have right now is fixed income exposure. So to the extent that if it is successful, it provides, in essence, an alternative to that. And Curtis may disagree with that comment. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think in normal times, that's fair. But I think that if you're thinking about yeah. fixed income, which is very low in this office now, and during crisis in which you want to have money to be able to reallocate into the equity markets, the question is, is hedge funds in that kind of market the kind of liquidity and you're able to get it and convert it. Now, you know, I'm, you know, you're hearing skeptics and you're hearing positive people. There's, it's very controversial. I would argue that it, it's, I question the liquidity during market stresses. Whereas fixed income, there's certain parts of the fixed income portfolio during extreme market stresses like high yield and stuff may not, you may not like the pricing. Uh, so it's, it may not be that liquid, but 70% of that portfolio is liquid. Just be aware. So the trade-off, what I think Eric is talking about is hedge funds for fixed income in normal times. Yeah. If you look at tail risk, which is Alan talking about, I would argue that hedge funds give you a lot more liquidity and give you negative correlations to, to equities during the crises. Uh, you mean fixed you income mean, or hedge fund? Excuse me, <laughs> fixed income. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, when you have a flight to quality, you have to have the highest quality assets. Amen. And that's where the liquidity is. So this really highlights, if I may, uh, this morning we talk about the limitations of modern portfolio theory and mean variance optimization. And one of the limitations is really that that conventional framework considers volatility as the only source of risk. If we factor, factor in other sources of risk, such as liquidity, transparency, and the ability of generating income, which is much more important to us now, if we put all the risk consideration, consideration together in a holistic way, comprehensive way, I think that's kind of the research we need to do more and more to see what is a more effective and efficient diversifier for the equity uh, risk in our portfolio. So the dilemma continues. <laughs> Are there other observations or comments? Anyone? Okay, excellent. At this point, I think we. I think the original plan was to potentially take a, a quick break. Was at this point, and then we were going to continue on with the last segment of this, where uh, Ben and Alan will be going through. Uh, some of the potential candidate portfolios and some of the risk uh, considerations that spin from those from those portfolios. So, okay, we'll take a fifteen-minute break. Perfect.